And we're with my co-host. Hello, this is David Collins. David Collins. David Collins. That's a name I've not heard for a long time. At least since last Sunday. Last Sunday. It's been at least a week since I've heard that name. And also, like the times I talked to you this week, I heard yes. your name. I said, I heard the name from my mouth. Yes, and, well, and we've been talking for the last hour. And, that, and I, may, I must have said your name like half a dozen times. Maybe. Maybe. So it turns out I we're hear liars. your name like all the time. <laughs> yes, we're just lying. That's a name I've heard all the time. We still have Vader up on the. Uh, up and on the... oh, we have someone else with us. Who else? Hello. Is with us? Who is this? We would like to introduce our first developer <clears throat> guest from the Force Unleashed <clears throat> team that is joining us this week. Yes. Producer Brett Rector. Say hello, Brett. Hello, Brett. Very. <laughs> oh, Brett, hey. you've done us hey. dirty. It's always good. It's always good. <laughs> It's always good to do the jokes. It always works. He did the joke, and he it was good. He did the joke. It was very, it was quite nice. This was always wise. This was not scripted in any way, shape, or form. No. We're no, just I guess off not. the cuff. We've actually, we actually, Brett, we did write a script for you, and we're going to be sending it to you right now. No, no. We've said everything. You, you just that... have to guess. No sending. <laughs> That's right. We sent you a script. I promise it. I will hit all the beats, and I will not talk out of turn. Don't ever talk out of turn. You know what? I'm going to and don't do ask it. for beats. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to the training room. Oh, go into the training. Let's room. Let's go into the training room. The which is not something that everyone knows about this training room. That's it, true. We we never uh, enforce that in the Force Unleashed because we wanted to unleash your force. We didn't uh, you want it to what? be the enforced unleash or like the so, training unleash. It, exactly. Who needs oh, training? <laughs> You're just like flipping the lightsaber there like, this guy sucks. He just falls over on his own. So now, Brett, tell everybody what your position, you know, what your position was on the team and what your experience was like in two minutes. Go! No, but All right. just give, give it a just general <laughs> overview. I'm on of the your... clock. Let, let me go get some coffee and I'll spiel that up for you. Anyway, yes. Yeah. No, I was uh, actually one of the first production hires um, almost 10 years ago uh, right now. Before um, that, you were you, weren't you the editor in chief of Star Wars Insider Magazine before I, right before that? Yes, I was. Yes, and, that's right. And, and one of my greatest days was when Sam Witwer came to see us, and then he whispered in my ear as he left the final final. I had a I had an Insider subscription, and it made my day. Yes, you know, I, when, I, this when is, you this had, happened. It it did happen. See, it you know it, it's okay, Sam. I, I I chronicle these things in my mind because you know there's a lot of room in there to stuff the interesting things that happened. And yes. uh, and I remember that from ten years ago. But no, it's uh, it was it actually was a, a really it was really nice to hear that from you know from a fan to a person who obviously loves Star Wars and is now indelibly a part of the circle. You are That's in right. the circle. That's right. I'm just, I'm I'm in I'm still in the outer rim. I'm still trying to make my way off of Tatooine. Not true. Uh, one day, no, not one true. day, I will get no. to the. I'll, I'll get to the core system. I will get there. I will get there. You're already Sorry. there. Yeah, you're editor in chief of Star Wars <laughs> Insider Magazine, and yeah. Sorry. No, so so uh, uh, to your question, David. Yes, I was. Um, I actually had. I had, I was. I was at Lucas Arts as a manual writer, and then I, you know, took this great job, this great opportunity with the Insider Magazine, and then I came back, you know. You know, I was but the learner, but I wasn't the master. But you know, I, I, I came back to Lucas Arts, and my first foray into gamings was uh, as a producer was on The Force Unleashed, which is great. Yeah, and one of the interesting things about your job is, you know, you kind of were, you and Devin Hitch and a couple of other producers were really the eyes and ears of everything going on in the project, and you also were responsible for the making of book, right? Which you was fantastic. Hate. That was a great book. Thank you very much. Thank you. And and what was crazy about that book is like Aiden and I, uh, you know, uh, project lead Aiden Blackman. Um, he uh, I co-authored that with him. Because he'll, he'll, and he'll, it'll, it's all lies. You, Just yeah. Spin some lies. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> well, the thing is, is like we, you know, we we kept talking to the publisher. It's like you know what, we're we're not ready right now. Like you know, they wanted to, like they we basically got the book done without any screenshots from the game. Whoa! Get no screenshots from the game because we weren't there yet to take screenshots. So, so we produced, uh, and I'm looking at it right now, and it's, it's uh, you know, it's like a hundred and something pages of, of a game, and we don't even have a screenshot from the game. We 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 have some uh we had some early kind of like animation stills and s some stuff from Sam, where when we got his face into the game, 
Um, but other than that, it was it was all concept art. It was really driven, um, and that's what I think was really great about this book because it was really driven by the concept artists um, and their work. Amy Beth, Chris Voy, Stephen Chang, Chin Ko, you know, and, and uh, you know, handful of other of, of other great artists. And you know, it was just really interesting that we didn't have any actual game shots, but. Well, that was true. Right. That was true for a lot of the game's production because there was a huge publishing program that was going on around the Force Unleashed. Yet, uh, the game was running behind. You know, I think everyone knew that it was it was supposed to come out in uh, originally 2007, and it didn't yep. end up coming out until I believe was it September 18th, 2008 was the launch. It was. Day? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it took so. a little time to get there, but we eventually got there. And uh, but that means well, that the, yeah. the action figures came out early. The uh, the the well, no, the novel came out around well, the same time. But the, but actually, the making a book. Well, the, by the way, the, another thing is uh, Rodney Thompson over at Wizards of the Coast. He um, they had a Force Unleashed campaign guide for the Star Wars role playing game, and Rodney at some point. Force Unleashed was running so behind that Rodney was like, "Can we just please put the book out and call it the Imperial Source Book?" And just call you know just call it something else, and and I guess Lucas Arts was or Lucas Film was like no, and so they had to wait, and and he was happy they waited because he's like well you know we would have had to change around some Force Unleashed stuff and not release it in the book, but they were everyone was chomping at the bit to get their work out. Yeah, no, a hundred percent, man. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, the toys. There was a really big, and that was that was actually part of my role in production was to to talk with the gentle giants the sideshows hasbros and kind of pitch our idea for this game and you know basically why do you want to make why would you want to make toys from this game and we gave them uh, a lot of reasons and there was a lot of i think successful and i i just uh, the other day i just unearthed some some, some incredible t figures oh yeah uh, specifically for the for the for force unleashed like you know, jacked up and sad Vader and right. Sam. We got Juno. We had you know a host of, of stormtroopers that we created for the game, and it, it, it was just a really exciting time to uh, and you know, and I'm sure you guys have come through just before that. You know, we got to make a game that was right after episode you know, three, the, the, the prequels. Like mm -hmm. we were that, that was that was the wheelhouse. We got we got to we got to play in that sandbox. So right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I remember, you know what I bought? It's funny, when I left LucasArts, I remember going through a real period of sadness over, you know, especially when uh, when LucasArts, you know, went through what it went through and closed down. I started buying up a lot of old Force Unleashed toys that I hadn't quite gotten yet. And I found this giant Target exclusive of a Felucian Rancor with a Felucian Shaman on it that I still have. And the thing is massive. I don't even know where to put it. I should bring it next time. You should. I'll bring it. We'll just, you know, well, put it in front of the camera. And 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 to that point, David, like we, the Felucian Shaman, his look is only retained because I think at the time, like art direction wasn't really happy with with that direction, but we had already showed, uh, and I think it was Hasbro. Here's what we're gonna do, and then I I had to go back one day. I was like, well, it may not look like that, and uh, and Chris Gallagher and licensing is like, no man. It has to you look like to, that. You yeah. you have to put this figure because they are making this toy based on what you guys are doing in the game. Wow, crazy. So, and and that was a lot of angst, you know, for Hayden and and uh, Matt Omernick, our art director, and that you know we, you know that it, you, you know from we you know one month to the next, you know, just like oh, we're not really happy with this with this design, but. Right, the because game is still deep in committed. development. Yeah, yeah, because we committed, and Hasbro went to go to, to make you know the sculpt. They're like, no, you yeah. have to have this in the game, and that <clears throat> there was a there was a you know a, a small point of contention on, on that front because um, you know they had already moved forward, and we couldn't we couldn't back out. And, and and pull that out and 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 redo them and do a new guy it so. speaks to the it speaks to how big the uh, publishing program in general and how big the force unleashed was as an as an initiative a game and a whole program kind of similar to what shadows of the empire was in 96 i mean it was really but on a much bigger scale but even bigger Huge, bigger scale yeah in fact yeah. one of the things that came out that i just love i wanted to show this yeah, to everybody this. this is the rogue shadow lego that came out and you've got the battle damaged vader you've got juno flying in the cockpit there if you can see that you've got a, it looks like you have two star killers on here a 3po and yeah 
couple yeah. star killers. Yeah. Star killing it. Star killing it. And then you could turn this and it would just come in for a landing like that, you know, which is pretty cool. But yeah, this this was everyone had one of these in their office, one of these uh Rogue Shadow Lego pieces. We were so excited when these came in. I also have the mini busts over there of, of Star Killer, like Ultimate oh, yeah. Ultimate Evil. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. I was at I was at Comic Con and uh there was uh, the gentle. I think it was the gentle giant booth. That's who did the minibus, right? The, of course yeah. it is. And I was at the gentle giant booth, and there was like, there were un, unpainted prototypes of of minibus, and there was one particularly. And again, it was just gray and unpainted. And I remember looking at this one and being like, that guy looks familiar. Who is that? <laughs> and I started looking at his features, and and I'm like, oh, the, oh, that's me, because <laughs> it was off of the head scan. It was off of the. You know, it was literally my face and my skull right. and everything. So it was. And, and honestly, I think that's one of the only collectibles from the game that I don't have. And I remember that. I think that was an exclusive, like the the good and the light side. I, I remember in you in your angelic white robe. <laughs> yes, but even that, you know, spoilers. Even spoilers. the gentle giant one was not the final design from the game. In fact, right. like for example, if you look at the Star Killer action figure, it's an earlier design of his outfit from the first level. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot yes. of things that you you get to see the iterative process because it's it's similar but it's not exactly. For example, the uh, even the Wizards of the Coast stuff, they made uh, miniatures. There's a proxy miniature. There's mm -hmm. a Star Killer miniature for their miniatures game, and even that is based on slightly out of date concept art. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not exactly what ends up in the game, which I think is kind of neat. You see, the, uh, you, I remember, and, and I, I have to say that that uh, Hayden basically made me give you the. Uh, Star Killer um, figure from my collection. So, <laughs> did um, he really? Yes, he did. He came to me. He's like, I'd like you to. And, it's just and, like, and not in hey, any hey, words. Yeah, I'd like okay, you to do me a personal oh, favor. Oh. And would you just give Sam this toy? I'm like, <laughs> but it will break the set. Like, it broke my set. It broke the set. <laughs> it broke the set. Yeah, well, I, you know, <laughs> you, okay, so I'm looking at him That's right here. I'm looking at the figure from your set. And the thing is, is you know what sucks about that is I also have my own set. Yes. So I no, broke I... your set for nothing. It was completely in vain. <laughs> oh. So, Brett, if you'd like me to send you back your figure, <laughs> I'd be happy to reunite you with your set. Because I'm looking at the... I have Starkiller, Ultimate Evil, and Ultimate Good. He has and... like six six of them. <laughs> They're all standing up next <laughs> to each other. They're all standing up next to each other. He's actually stacked <laughs> them into a giant... Um, construct a so con star killer. you're literally beside yourself, Sam. Yeah, and, and they're all time. congratulating each other. Yeah. <laughs> like, th th three versions away, just like, but look, guys, I'm here. I'm the real, I am, I'm the real Sam. Well, what you, what you didn't know is, what you didn't know is Sam, actually, after that happened, went around to everyone's desk and said, I heard you have a star killer. Give it to me. Hayden said so. <laughs> all of a sudden, he, he's got Legion. It's Legion <laughs> yes. of Sam Whitmer as star killer. God, you know, my, it's, it should be called the Ego Unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, we hired this actor who has a tremendous ego, but I think we can get it a little bigger. What do you think? Yeah. But By the time we release the game, I think we can really scale well, it up. And, I tried it with honestly, proxy, it didn't point, work. I know we're kind of going off on a collectible tangent, but that, you know, that's kind of my wheelhouse. And, you know, as Dave knows, and you know, Sam, just the, the collecting aspect of Star Wars is so huge, and it's a big part of my life, and it always has been. Um, but I always lament that, that, that Sideshow never got on the horn to do a star killer one six scale what's I mean, wrong with those guys yeah what is wrong with those guys because <clears throat> i'm sitting here i'm actually looking at one of my stormtroopers and it's it's so crazy because one of the characters that at, at, as a lowly producer who has no creative input whatsoever but <laughs> manages the spreadsheets I got, work, I got to work with, i got to work with stephen chang uh concept artist extra extraordinaire who also did the rogue shadow lego i mean he was so ecstatic He's like uh, something I drew is is now a toy. Now he's drawing he's he's drawing a uh, uh, futuristic spacecraft uh, for NASA. Wow! I mean, that, was that what Steve O was doing? A, yeah, like like on his and in his spare time, he, wow. there there are like all these photos that have come up. And, and his dad apparently was um, in aviation in aviation design, so he's kind of moving it forward. But it's so crazy that, that a person like that, like this, was his first. You know, like he'd never had any of his images published until the Rogue Shadow, which was actually the first design on Felucia. Uh, Dave, do you remember the uh, painting that we had in a uh, yes? Was it Sea Building? By the way, Sam, Sam, what is this? What is that? That's the Rogue Shadow. No, it's the first man mission to Mars. It's the Thanks first. to Steve Chang. 
<laughs> Sorry, go ahead. You were saying. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, so no, but I, do, I, I do remember that Felucian. Uh, design a, a stormtrooper with Stephen Chang, and I, I never really, at the end of the day, I was, it, it was the stormtrooper commander in the Force Unleashed, so we were going to make Felucia stormtrooper, so a little. I do remember that Felucian. Uh, design a, a stormtrooper. What was that? Is that you? Or is that you, Brett? <laughs> Brett, I think it's you, right? What is that? What is that? Is that? I think that's you. <laughs> hot oh, pockets God. brings. That's it. Hey, we got a hot so pockets. We got a hot pockets commercial. <laughs> I think that was you. All of a sudden, my flash started working. It, you know, <laughs> just the appropriate time, I might add. But <laughs> yay, technology! The Force Unleashed commentary is brought to you by Hot Pockets. Hot Pockets. So and I got Starbucks. to design this uh, stormtrooper, and and actually. It's the one character that is so prevalent in in toys. Like Hasbro made a small one, Sideshow, because they had the Stormtrooper mold, like did a Stormtrooper. Is this the Stormtrooper uh, commander with the blue stripe? Is that Yeah, that? exactly. Yeah, exactly. He's all over Which, the place. He's still around that guy. He's He's been working ever since for some I know. Yes. And it's crazy because you're like, oh, he's the commander. It's like, yeah, let, let, let's, let's paint the commander yeah. and have him stand out among all things. But... Yeah, so you could shoot him first if you were like yeah, a rebel exactly. sniper. Yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah. I think it's that guy. It's the one in yeah. blue that we can see very yeah. clearly. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's shoot that guy. Let's shoot him. Shoot him now. Get that guy. Oh, he's, he's turning invisible. Now he's he's now oh, he's turning invisible. Oh, and he has a shield. You're right. <laughs> so you, you know what I did want to ask you about, Brett, because this is something you brought up before the show. Um, the the team had a really strong team culture i mean i think anyone who knows if you if you go through something you know <laughs> teen culture teen culture yes we have, we have copies of tiger beat everywhere <laughs> and uh we're constantly blasting uh in sync and hansen oh no what is this uh, what, was, what year was yeah. it 2008 what years what was, of, what, that would have been after hansen yeah yeah it was it was a post hansen world but it was before in. bieber after hansen before bieber yeah so, so whatever that was <laughs> B, Strong uh, teen culture. Yeah, uh, AHBB after <clears throat> yeah, Hanson, exactly. before Bieber. Right, right. It was a per period well known in Star Wars it, fandom. So, no, but but the team culture. We had team meetings every week, right? So, uh, week. you want to tell people a little bit how those team meetings would go? Because I, and it's starting with what Hayden made us all say at the top of this. I mean, literally, I remember that. we go into a movie theater just so everyone's listening. We go into this giant movie theater uh, at ILM called the Premier Theater. And at that point, probably the largest we ever got was well over 100 people attending these meetings. It's probably more like 120, 130 when all the marketing people and everybody else came in. And how did we start those meetings, Brett? Well, it was based. You're right. It was it was the five questions like when you know what's the name of the game. Force you know, Unleashed. Force Unleashed. You know what? Who who are you? Darth Vader Secret, Secret Apprentice. Secret Apprentice. You know what do you do? You know just what's the theme of the game? The theme. Redemption. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man, you know now. Then there were, wasn't there? Hold on. There, you guys are missing one thing. What? What's it about? Kicking someone's ass. Oh, with, kick, yeah. The what's force, a core gameplay? Exactly. He said, "What's a core gameplay?" We all said, "Kicking ass with the force." Like it was one of those like mantras that we all got on, and we all were like trying to maintain the same vision of what the game was supposed to be. And so he made everyone say this mantra at the top of everything, just just to keep 150 people focused on the same thing. Yes. And and I it, well it was great and and that's a great thing about Hayden Blackman as a leader and not only just a great Star Wars mind if I could say that, but um, yeah it, it, he just wanted everyone to be focused and you know after two years of saying that like you know once a week every week um, you know people are just kind of like ah, ah, you know kind of got lackadaisical but I swear to God when we were done with all our meetings, it was the last team meeting. Like people were like weeks after were like, they wanted to say, they wanted to repeat the mantra. It's like, yeah. at first it became a chore and kind of a, a kitschy thing. And then it's just like, oh man. But it really, to your point, David, was a rallying point for the whole team. And we got, we got excited every week. We sat in the premier theater and we, and we passed around. It was basically a, a Yoda lightsaber. And, and and certain, you know, someone would win it every week. Was, wasn't it and, called the Jedi Forge Award? Is that it what was, it was called? Exactly. It was the Jedi Forge Award. So how did that work? Someone someone would give out a Jedi Forge Award to a certain team member who that week, can you... Yeah, it, I mean, it, let, let, let's say, you know, Concept Art would, would get it one week, Amy Beth. And she would, you know, then she would say, you know, I really, for this week, I really want to pass this on to, you know, uh, Chris McGee because he did a really great thing in design. So then it would get passed from team member to team member, and it, it wasn't, 
it wasn't like Hayden sat there and was like, who are we going to give the, the award to? He, he, you know, he just really wanted to foster that, that creative spirit and that team atmosphere because we, this was such a huge, huge game, especially internally uh, for, the, for, for the studio. And it was, just, it was just giving back to one another because yeah. we, were, we were in it every day. We were in it every day for two years. Mm. And, and it, it was just a great way for, 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 for peers to recognize peers. And I, and I just thought that was a great device uh, from Hayden because it wasn't like, all right, here's Thursday night, so-and-so, bring me the saber, and I will decide and decree who gets this award. Right. Yeah, you know, it was, it was it, a peer-given award, yeah. Yeah, so it was just, it was just you know, and we all recognized the greatness of everybody on the team. But it was so nice to have those little special moments of, you know, I, I'm here and I want to give I want to present this to you because you did a great thing for the game this week. And we, we were all doing great things. But, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, the Jedi Forge Award was just something that, that we carried through that game into the sequel. And even on a couple of other teams, they kind of adopted, right. like, their own kind of Jedi Forge Award uh, for recognition and, and just solidarity because, it, you know, it's... As as we all know, making games is not easy, right? And and, and living day to day, like and 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 your point, David. I mean, we I think we burgeoned up to 180 people, yeah. At one point, like yeah. we were just we were just pulling in people from everywhere because we needed to get this game done, and it was just a Herculean effort. New new tech, you know, and just very exciting. It was very exciting all around. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It was it was a really exciting time, and it was an enormous task. I, I remember. Just to kind of give you an idea of the size of the team, um, yeah, we should get to that question. Mm -hmm. To give you an idea of the size of the team, uh, you could point to something like, uh, was it Devin that had to go to Costco like probably three or four times a week? Yeah, we, we, had, a, we had a weekly Costco run. It was Devin and Cameron Suey. And it was a, there was a snack room. <clears throat> and uh, this snack, snack room. It was, it was like to the tune of, I think every other week, David, it was to, to the tune of like, yeah, like $600. Yeah, in, and we're talking about like peanut butter cups, six hundred dollars, right? We're God, talking about wow. the amount of food, the amount of like. The, at one point, it just got so bad because we were just living there seven days a week. Um, I mean, looking back on it, it's fun. You know, it's fun to think about like, God, those are the good, you know, the the good old times, right? Because we're really proud of what we did. But you know, at the time, it's tough. You know, you're 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 exhausted, and and you just need to go back to your desk and you take a break, and you run into someone at the snack room, and the snack room was like just filled with all kinds of goodies and there were like fruits and other things in there too but for the most part it was like you know oh, it's developer food it's developer food yeah it was just all <laughs> kinds of junk food and the thing is it would disappear in a day and a half i'd be like how are we ever going to eat this and then like two days later it was gone and all that was left were like nature valley bars or something like that which no one wants which nobody wants nice you know. work cam way to go Devin, <laughs> come on, guys. Nature Valley, come on. Yeah, flip over now? the table. Yeah, no, no diabetes no. valley, more like it. Yeah, come exactly. On, guys. Come on. I'm no. I'm so excited. Techno, I have caught up with technology, and I can see Sam and yes. David Hello. and Felucia. Yes, that's right. That's right. And that is that is good times. And actually, David, uh, one of the first uh, levels that uh, Peter Hirschman really got excited about was when we went through Felucia. And we, we had the big reveal of the of the ad at. Remember that you fight through it. Remember when? Oh yeah, there was days, like a, there was like, like a metal door. There was like a big metal gate. Yeah, that like, to... and he's like ripping open the door, and yeah. then oh no, it was the rancor. It wasn't yeah. an ad. It, it wasn't was an ad. It was a he rancor. He came through, yeah. and that was like the big finale. But it, it's so it's so crazy now to like step back in time and 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 know what Felucia looked like when we were really excited at, the, at, at when we were developing the game and, and how it evolved later with all the tech, DMM, natural yeah. motion, I mean, all this what, good stuff. What was natural motion? Tell, tell us about that. What is that? That was like biomechanical AI. That's, that's so euphoria. They were oh, going to react yeah. realistically yeah. to, you know, what, what, what the character, would, you know, it wasn't, it, we wanted to go beyond just simple ragdoll physics. And so we want we wanted just to have this natural <laughs> natural motion. Hey, what what a great name for a company. They should call it that. Hey, I have yeah. a question for you. Uh, maybe you can answer this uh, continuity question. This is from the from the uh, from the chat room here. Question: Star Killer had to kill stormtroopers in the beginning of the game to keep himself a secret, right? Weren't there security cameras and investigators who were like, "Dang, there's like a hundred dead guys with lightsaber wounds." Hmm. He he killed the security cameras too. He also killed the people that watched the security cameras and the people that made them. 
Just kills well, the whole company. Or he, or he actually he was, was the developer everybody. of the security I mean, cameras and was no, like, like he man, went to, you did not see that. He went to ADT and <laughs> these mind tricked people. The and that storm tubers you're looking for. The ones he couldn't mind trick, he just killed. Now, I remember, okay, so, all right, one of the things that, um, well, well that the is, thing is, is, like, Vader just, like, at any cost. I mean, because yeah. Vader, like, if you look in, like, in comics today or in whatever, just, like, at any cost, you know, you're serving the Empire. Well, Do I need to yeah. sacrifice a few stormtroopers? Sure. Well, it's, I'll point you to a movie example of, of how this works, right? I mean, there's we to be fair to the question, we never really explain that in the game, right? So it's you true. call it a plot hole. However, it's very easily explainable. If I was Leland Chi, Keeper of the Holocron, or something like that, what I would probably <laughs> say is... Well, listen, you know how in Return of the Jedi, when they start chasing after the speeders and the first thing that Luke says to Leia is jam their comlink, center switch, right? It's so they can't call for help, right? So you could conceivably say that Juno sitting in the rogue shadow just jammed all communications out of the TIE Fighter construction facility by positioning themselves in a certain place or whatever so that there were no witnesses and then Starkiller before he left probably just destroyed all evidence. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to explain it, but, you know, we figured we should probably get on with the action rather than, you know turn it into a, a splinter cell game or something like that where you have to go right. you know I mean, kill 100 I, cameras or you can't progress or something yeah because at the end of That's the day splinter, i mean so i don't you know, know what I'm talking like, about. They're, they're bending to the empire's will to the emperor's will and if if a few stormtroopers gotta go they gotta go they gotta I mean, go yeah it's just like which by the way sorry to the 501st guys like we're really yeah we apologies for that. so many limbs it's not a it's not a cool way to treat you guys uh we haven't given you proper respect but also, deal with it. You're a stormtrooper. Get used to it. <laughs> this is your life. Yeah, exactly. And and at the time, it's like, are they clones? Are they not clones? Like, you know. Yeah. Was, we just, go through that conundrum in the Clone Wars cartoon. It's like, how do we, you know, like, they're they're not just a number. There's names to these people. But right. sadly, in our game, we, we didn't have any, you know, didn't have any cool names. Oh, you're spanking him with your lightsaber. That's, That's basically just wrong. what happened. I bent him over. You did. And you spanked just said, him with the lightsaber. This way. This way. This is your punishment. This is what happened. Yeah. Aberrant. You've been a bad boy. You've been a bad monkey. Bad. Bad. <laughs> um, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, these are the purge troopers that we were talking about a couple of. Which apparently are clone troopers that were chopped up into little pieces and put inside robots, right? Basically. Something like that. Yeah. So Hayden got his well, horror. On, and and you know, actually, uh, one of the great things I was thinking of this the other day when David just like, hey, would you, well, which was yesterday, hey, would you like to, you know, kind of <laughs> last minute take this? <laughs> but uh, just, just thinking about some of the characters and like the the, the shadow guards are an interesting um, character for me because they have like the they had like the 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 lightsaber blade with with like two, you know, it's like a staff, a lightsaber staff. Yeah, and we really want to make those characters. Just like we want to make them badass, you know. Right. And, and we had we had one of our first inclinations was that these shadow troopers they're they're more hardcore than the Royal Red Guard, and wouldn't it be cool if these shadow guards were uh, lobotomized Jedi? Yeah, and right. at one right. point, and we could not get it, we couldn't get it past the powers that be, but we were going to have one of them instead of having a red lightsaber have a purple lightsaber. Oh. No. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Miss Windu. <laughs> Miss Windu. But, <laughs> and, and, but we weren't going to say that it was it was Mace Windu. It was just going to be that it, you know to infer potentially. But again, the powers that be are just like no, Mace Windu died when the Emperor threw him out the window. There, there, there's no recovering his body in the depths of Coruscant. And you're not, you know, you're not going to do this. Yeah, it's kind of, and, and it's kind of like Luke's just, lightsaber on on Cloud City. It's like it fell into a bottomless pit. There's no recovering. Ooh. Oh, wait a second. Ooh. Oh, okay. Force <laughs> Awakens. <laughs> By the way, did you, Brett? Side note, did you watch the uh, new Force Awakens trailer with uh, presumably new John Williams music in it? The one that was on uh, was TV. Oh, you did. I did. You died. I died. Did you see that? I, I did. I and I saw the international version, and and you know, and and the great thing about Star Wars and the music is that the music. It enhances the scene without overpowering the scene. So yeah. I know where you're getting at, David. It's like, and it's, and it uh, it all just flowed seamlessly for me. So I, I I'm not going to be able to pick out the nuance. 
But did you but see that there was a new one that came out that had this theme that went like this. Da, bum, da, 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 and I was like, uh, yeah, very, da, that's right. Da, we were talking da, about da, this. Da, da, star killer. Da. Uh, exactly. Yes. Very. It, yes. He is Ray's cousin. I don't, <laughs> uh, no. But it was a adopted child of the Skywalker family. Yeah. Who knows? No, very reminiscent of our excellent soundtrack. Yeah, it was it was great. Um, and that and that's one of the travesties, actually, as we were talking about earlier. Like, why that we didn't have like a um, and obviously there's all kinds of copyright issues, this, that, and the other, and but we couldn't have we couldn't have uh, we we couldn't release the soundtrack as its own entity, which is that's a, right is, yeah. is a shame. It's a big shame. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, because we had, I mean, one one of one of the one of the gems, the jewels, and I'm not just saying this because David Collins was a big part of that department, but uh, our sound, you sound guys, killed it all the time. Oh, and, very and, kind I, of and I and I always think about in the process of making games and how you guys were just like we're the last to know. And we come in at the end of the day, <laughs> and we and we save the day. It's like we save the day. With with you know just with with the sounds the, the the tracks like the mixing like you I mean to all the people out there that don't know the sound department are the unsung heroes of all of all the games of any game that you that you play and I didn't even pay him to it, say any of this but it's true and I'm sure I'm sure they all lament the same thing just like oh you guys oh it's this? it's it's you know it's 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 actually my favorite part of game development obviously because I'm in it but uh, but because it's it's your opportunity to basically put the icing on the cake, which is all the hard work that all the artists and game designers and everybody do does. And like to be able to kind of see something just explode off the screen with sound is my favorite part. Well, it's the same is true with uh, movies, video games, or and I wanted to, shows. I wanted to ask you, um, um, since we have you here, David. Oh yes, um, I'm always here. We haven't talked about this yet. How you you were six months from release of the game and had to tear out the sound engine and no, we, create we did, a new one. We did talk about that. We did talk about that. I wasn't listening. Uh, Would you tell... <laughs> could you tell... Sam, can you stop playing with <laughs> No. Listen. Uh, listen to David. I'm con- <laughs> I, yeah, but, no. But it was, tell Brett about it, because I don't think he knows. Well, yeah, so we had a... You know, we had an internal engine that just wasn't... It just wasn't cutting it. I mean, the amount of sounds we were... We probably had fourteen to 20,000 different unique sound files... And that was just sound effects. It's not voiceover and music and all that. I mean, we had so many different sound files, and we had a, an engine that just wasn't uh, able to to handle it. And so it was, you know, brought up as a red flag. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was brought up as a red, red flag, and, and so we had to recreate a sound engine. And so, you know, a lot of engineers just suddenly were creating a sound engine at the, you know, probably sometime in the fall of 07, and the game... You know, we we finished making the game around May of '08 and then released it in September, I think. But um, <clears throat> it was very, very scary. And and so what I was doing was, you know, whoever was making any sounds, we would share it via QuickTime movies at these at these team, you know, uh, team meetings. Which is basically people, scoring like a movie. Yeah, scoring like a, a movie as opposed to an interactive game. Yeah, we'd export animations out of the game. We would export levels. I we you know we were still creating content as best we could, even though we had no integration going. Uh, we knew what the game needed, but it was, it was, I mean, it just probably, probably one of the most stressful uh, uh, projects in my life, and then also the most rewarding. But everyone was very positive about it, and very supportive about it, and Hayden was very supportive, and, you I know, I just but, can't imagine that, to, to put all this work in and go, and six months before release go, so listen, we got to redo all of that. Yeah, It huge. doesn't work. We can't, we have to, the game, you know, hey, Hayden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's going on, David? You know how the game had sound a little while ago? Be like, yeah. Well, it doesn't now. Yeah. And now we need to have it make make it have sound again. Yeah. Huge is, shout is that out. When to... they went to your house, David, at like five in the morning. Like, no, uh, no, that's a great. Where, where does David Collins live? Because we need and and, they, and and I don't know who it was, but I, apparently they were like David Collins. That was Hayden. Okay, so David there. Collins. This is a what is a true story. Okay, so I don't First know if all, I ever told you this story. David Collins lived very close to to the. He, you lived on the. Presidio. No, no, no. This was before. No, that. this is before. Oh. This so, is when he was in. Mar- in, I was in, in Marin the County. Marin side of the, okay. the bay. So, uh, okay, and, so and they had to go find David at five in the morning because we were. You know, it was it was, it was four like in the morning. A rush job to like get something done and. 
Okay, here's and here. This is the real story. Where David lives, so they I just went around this. and like yelled. Like, let me let me tell you. Screaming. Let me tell you the story. Okay, so <laughs> so the story goes like this. Uh, there was a demo, and this was a lot. This was a demo that was going in front of George Lucas at 9 a.m. Okay, it was a tech demo. It was back in the day. Remember when Matto was on last time? We talked about that tech demo. Um, it was a tech demo showing off digital molecular matter, DMM. And so there were a lot of temp sounds that were in there. Uh, at the time, I was still finishing Thrillville off the rails. So this was 2000, maybe 2006. Oh, no, the original Thrillville. And so there was some sound that was put in the game, but we really hadn't, um, you know, it was like 7 p.m. the night before, and people were still kind of futzing with it and whatever. Peter Hirschman and Eric Antonovich and a bunch of people pulled an all-nighter and basically decided sometime in the middle of the night that rather than actually show it at runtime, they were going to show George a DVD. Or maybe, no, it was earlier in the day, the day before. They're like, we're going to show him a DVD. So, you know, I remember um, the this, this story of Eric Antonovich going, you know, Peter Hirschman's in a meeting going, we need to revise the whole menu in front of the DVD before we go in. And Eric's like, it's just a menu. Why don't we focus on this? Why, why, are, we, why are we focusing so hard on this? And Peter Hirschman just goes, Eric, it's George Lucas. And he's like, you know what, you're, 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 you're right. Okay, I'll redo it. I'll redo it. You know, so like everyone was working so hard because they were going to show George's thing the next morning. So, you know, we didn't really know uh, really kind of what was going on. We knew peripherally. We hung out until around 7 p.m. and just, uh, you know, and we didn't know if the meeting was going to be pushed or whatever. But I went home. Maybe it was around 7, got home around 8, 830. Phone never rang. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Went to bed. Sometime around 4 in the morning, I get a call from Matt Philbrandt going, Hey, uh, David, it's uh, Matt. Uh, listen, um, Hayden's driving around looking for you right now. Driving around. And I was like, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah, uh, you, live in, you live in Marin, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I think he knows which, which apartment complex is yours he's looking for. I was like, wait, wait what's going on? Uh, it sounds like change on the floor. That's what he kept saying. It sounds like change on the floor. What? <laughs> well, okay, what he was referring to is that basically when you knocked over a certain object in that Rancor skeleton room of the demo... Um, some little things were falling on the floor, like shards of glass or something like that, and they were just spamming the sound engine. So it was like tink 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 tink. And when they captured that video, it was just going tink 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 like that. So I do remember that actually. So they woke up me and they woke up Jesse at like four in the morning and said, "Get down here as fast as you can." So I I got to the Presidio in San Francisco probably by around four forty five, and I took the video and just started putting in sound by hand, you know, just syncing to the video by hand for this presentation. Got it over to Eric around 8.30 or something like that. He took it, burned a DVD, and we ran over to B Building for a meeting that started with George at 9. And uh, that was the very beginning of production on The Force Unleashed, and if that was any sort of sign of how it was going to go. <laughs> I don't Dude, know. that just sounds like... like like I just can imagine, it's four a.m. Hayden Blackman's driving around Marin County, just David! like like rings under his eyes, going, it "Sounds like change on the floor." <laughs> sounds just like change on, on the floor. Change. And I have no ding, ding, idea ding, what ding, Matt ding. was saying to me. He just said it like two or three times. I'm like, He's I have crying. no, I have no idea what you're saying to me, Matt Philbin. Sounds like change on the floor. But I'm gonna go in. I'll just go into the office and figure it out. And as soon as I load up the video, I saw what was going on. It was yeah, the sound engine was getting spammed by all these little shards on the floor. Every time they moved a second, it would fire off a sound file of like tink. You know, which is supposed to be like this tiny little detail. So, so it just, all you kids out there that 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 think that uh, game making games is glamorous, oh think boy. again. Think again. It's a great story. A. It's For, a great story. I just love that he's driving him around Marin County, hoping to run into you. <laughs> yeah, like where's he? I he think goes into in a bar, one of, and you're like, I know it sounds like change on the floor. Yeah, I did that on is purpose. There David Collins here. Oh, David! Yeah, he's oh, David Collins. I'm he's on in my the fourth Nickelodeon. <laughs> he goes into a back room and in, 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 and there's like a, a stairway down to the basement, and there's David Collins with flipping your quarters, flipping with quarters a, down the down the stairway, flipping quarters tink, onto tink, a table tink, tink, with tink, a bunch tink. of other sound engineers playing Russian roulette, <laughs> or just playing quarters, <laughs> <laughs> or just yeah. And there's a, with a gun. <laughs> no. <laughs> Flip. Uh, see, it, it, it was those wacky sound guys. It's Dave. It's Jesse. They're just back there, like flipping quarters. Flipping quarters. Cup. Which is why it sounds like change. Yeah. Exactly. Yep, yep. You know, making demos. It's all good. Well, let's yeah. go. Let's That's go, how good David was. Let's talk about the story a little bit, Brett, because you, you were. I mean, you were right there next to Hayden pretty much the entire time of production. Were you pretty involved in in a lot of those story meetings or any interesting? Uh, 
uh, anecdotes that you have from the development of this game? We're looking at uh, Felucia 2 right now. and uh, Yeah, no, I, I got it. Yeah, it's, uh, no, it was just a really great thing to be able to kind of to tap in, and and I know that that the team wanted to go in different direction. We'd we'd seen, you know, Hoth. You know, every Star Wars game had Hoth and Tatooine. Right. So in our game, which we eventually we did go, for our DLC, but that's a different. <laughs> yeah, we we caved. <laughs> we'll get to that. We caved with we DLC. Totally caved. But anyway, no. So sorry, Brett. Go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say. So it was really great. Um, to, to bring Felucia to life because at the time, you know, episode three had had come out. And and we were treated to something you know that was that was other than snow and sand you know we had some fauna you know we had you know we had the lush the the beautifulness of, of Felucia even though we only saw it for like you know a few seconds in episode three but you know it was it was really key you know for the for the team to be able to show other planets and and other experiences because we really wanted to build you know on the Star Wars mythos and we really wanted to have we we just wanted to show like some new exciting things and and to have like an an overly large sarlacc like at the you know i mean bigger than the sarlacc on tatooine you know in the middle of felucia and you and you know as sam's going through right now just like battling waves and waves of, of enemies but it yeah it was it was very important to really kind of go to other places and to show fans and 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 and, and gamers like that you know there are other things out there besides these two environments so uh, you know for for us to be in Felucia I think was a really big thing and, and that really dovetailed into the DMM and I think that w those are even some of the first uh, models that, that Vic and his team made were in Felucia to have that kind of like undulation that gelatinous kind of yeah. vibe and that feel so it, it was a lot different than what we'd seen in, in games in Star Wars games before yeah. how did the TIE Fighter construction facility come about man so I mean it's that that was actually another great location and really we just wanted we just wanted a kick-ass sandbox where you you know you're able and and that was one of the first times that you know that as a jedi like because we you build up to it in the game where you're taking down the star destroyer but to be able to grab a, a tie fighter out of air mm -hmm. like flying and throw it at at, at at other things was just was just a big i mean it, it, it it's a nice star wars moment but it's also a great gaming moment Mm -hmm. And 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 the and the and that uh, facility really enabled us to like kind of go in there and have this great sandbox that that you're just pulling tie fighters out of the air. You're 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 throwing your saber. You're throwing stormtroopers around. You're throwing them over cat. I mean the whole like I don't know when we're, where where we had the Wilhelm scream. I'm sure you put it in there somewhere, David. I mean every Star Wars. I did not. You did I not, did not well, put in. The, what is oh, wrong? Oh, you with know you? what? It did. It is. You know what? It it'll come up on Raxus too. It's there once. Uh, I got to the point after Star Wars Bounty Hunter where I grew to hate the Wilhelm scream because um, the producers on that game, you know, loved it. And at the time, I loved it, too. And I thought, oh, this will be a great, a great uh, little Easter egg to put in. For those of you who don't know what the Wilhelm scream is, uh, Google it. You'll see some amazing videos. It's this scream sound effect that's been featured in all your favorite movies as an inside joke between Ben Burtt and other sound editors. Really, largely back in the '80s um, and into the '90s. It's been in all the Indiana Jones movies. It's been in Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Lord like, of the Rings. <clears throat> so, in Bounty Hunter, it ended up as like almost every other death yell in Bounty Hunter ended up being a Wilhelm scream. Seriously? And at the time, I thought it was, well, not quite that bad. But at the time, I you know we all thought it was hilarious. Um, you know, after doing it, I kind of regretted the decision. First of all, it's not my inside joke; it's Ben Burtt's. You know, but we just thought it was great and funny and. So I said, you know, for this, for Force Unleashed, I don't want to do the Wilhelm scream. I don't want to do it. Finally, I caved late into production. Um, and actually, Tom Bible put in the Wilhelm scream. And I'll point it out when it comes up. <laughs> uh, Brett, any, question, any questions you guys have for Brett? Um, you know, kind of as we're, as we're coming to, to the hour mark here. You know, I kind of have a question for Brett. Brett, tell us about stuff that went horribly wrong. Oh, man. Like, aside from casting. Where do we begin? No, you know what? Actually, really, and and I don't, I, I wouldn't say it was horribly wrong, but just really, as we were finding our way with the the Xbox um, uh, 360 and PS3, just finding a way to, to to bring the game to life, to to give gamers something that they hadn't seen, like and the new technologies, and it, and and that, and we spent so much time with the Pixelux guys and the natural motion guys. And at the same time, as David knows, we were in it with ILM. Like, finally, here we can start using technology 
for films in games. We can we can make a cinematic experience, and I think we got really close to that. So, not that something went horribly wrong, but just That's trying tough. to make it horribly right. I I mean, because we 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 had Eric Johnston, one of the greatest programmers in all the world, worked for NASA, worked at Lucas Arts for so many years. He's Batman, and, and he actually he's, he's Batman from Bat Kid Begins. He is Batman, and mm -hmm. he he is my superhero. He actually. was also and, and, Sean Donovan in the original V. Yeah, exactly. For those of you who don't know, if you watch Bat Kid Begins, you know the Bat Kid story, and you see EJ or Eric Johnson, the guy that was Batman that followed Bat Kid around San Francisco, go and watch the original V miniseries, and he's Mark Singer's son. He was a child actor. Yes. Uh, yeah. In that as well. Um, and I'm and a it's huge. Priceless. You were I'm, starstruck the first was, time you came to Lucas. I was Arts a huge fan. EJ. I'm I'm a, I'm a Beastmaster fan. I'm a V uh -huh. fan. Beastmaster. Anything yes. with Mark Singer. With Mark, you put Mark Singer in it. I'm a big fan of it. So here here's Sean Donovan himself, and so we took some pictures. I should put them on the the. Oh, they're show. on there. They're Are on they? There. Yeah, yeah. But you haven't seen me being. Um, Mike Donovan and him being Sean Donovan. No, right? no. Where I stand, <laughs> Mark Singer's always got his chest out like this. And where's my baseball hat? And yeah, you know, and Sean's always like this, and and Mark, so you know, and Rodgers hat on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then Michael Ironside over on the side. Michael just, Ironside, I'm yeah. telling you, Donovan, he's been he's been converted. Your kid isn't your kid anymore. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I'm Mark Singer. <laughs> I'm the Beastmaster. I'm I, well, I'm doing a terrible thing, job like, here. Like Eric would be there. Like you would leave, and he's there. You come in the morning, he's there. But he was the one that got the technology into the game, and. That that was actually a great day. Aside aside from the George letter, which I don't know if you guys had, had covered that before. No, what's the George but, letter? Oh, where, where where we basically asked George like, can we do X with this? Oh game? yes, the facts. The facts. The facts just that were sent man. over. Yeah, just can we can we use Princess Leia? Can we do this? Can we do that? And he just was like checking. Yes, yes, no, no. Yes, I, I yes, think no. the only thing he said no to was using Princess Leia and as a major character because we do have her in a cutscene. Obviously, um, on on you know when they're subjugating the Wookies, but that but that was it. We couldn't have her in the game as a playable character, right? Um, which right, right. actually one of our designs kind of called for that um, for for Leia to be a playable to, character. Yeah, to actually, and this is and and this is as kind of the as the script was kind of evolving, or and not necessarily the script because we didn't start the script until two thousand six, but. We had we had a lot of great concept art, and some of the concept art was basically like you're playing a Shaq T, and you're protecting Leia, and some has wow. the Shaq T, and then you kind of go on from there. Um, but but yeah, so I I think you know, and in a roundabout way to answer the question, like one of the greatest things was that day, aside from the facts, was Eric Johnston getting the game to run in engine with with these great new technologies. Yeah, I mean, right. it's, and that was you know, I'm not going to say it was all him, but you know, it was it was all him. Well, it was so. it was well, it was all him, but it was it also was it was also Mark Singer. Mark Singer, yeah, Mark yeah, Singer exactly. came in and well, he was oh, yeah. Mark Singer. When you meet a guy like Mark Singer, he instills in you a work ethic and a and a belief in oneself um, that that stays with you the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know from just from just Beastmaster alone, I I'm that much more unstoppable absolutely well i was talking the other day to my friends koto and poto and uh my neighbor my neighbor <laughs> my neighbor ruth what about um, you, I, I met a bird the other day named <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. yeah no he's a friend of mine too <laughs> he's a good, good we buddy. just had coffee at starbucks and they all said the same thing about mark singer he really got the game to work he really did um <clears throat> sorry when are uh, we doing beastmaster unleashed yeah beastmaster unleashed um, it's dinosaur master i want to answer a question on here do you think that simon Pegg likes force unleashed um, Force Unleashed is how I know Simon Pegg. He he loved this game. He was really really into it, and he even, um, as I understand it, like went on and and talked in various interviews about like why he thought this was a really appropriate and great Star Wars story. Um, but yeah, I ended up meeting him um, at a friend's place. Uh, we were all uh, at Frank Darabont's place, and and. Yeah, I met Simon. I was a big fan of his, and he was a big fan of Force Unleashed, and so we became we became friends through that. So the answer is yes. Simon Pegg uh, said something nice about a Star Wars. <laughs> 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 he, he once uh, he once said so, <laughs> something nice <laughs> about something with some prequel content in it. With some prequel content in it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll say this because you can't. Sam is actually probably uh, one of the greatest. Um, 
defenders of the prequels to Simon, as far as I know. Not that I was there. Yeah. But uh, it never go- those conversations never go well. Yeah. Um. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So Ugh. yeah. You can't say, yeah. Stand down, Simon. Stand down. Yeah. Exactly. You've made your point. You've sir. made your point. We don't get be a dick about it. Wait. 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 Though. Wait. But do you like those movies? <laughs> oh. Oh. You don't. You don't like those movies. Yeah. Okay. I didn't. I. I was. I didn't get it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Stop peeing in our prequel cereal. That's right. Um, so uh, no, now, it's, it's we completely respect his opinion. It's just it's like you, you've the right, first time you've said it. <laughs> yeah, the, or the first five times. The first five times it was fine. <laughs> um, by the way, this is remember when I was talking about my um, look, look at me changing the subject so slightly. Uh, remember that when I was talking about the uh, having that what is that that noodle dinner? It was for this stuff right here. All this ooh noodly stuff. I believe a lot of this was uh, Aaron Brown uh, doing most of this. I could be wrong. It could be Aaron and Brian. But Aaron Brown. We, we had such a good sound crew. Brett, we did have a question for you. Um, what are you What are you working on now? What projects are you working on now? You shared a book uh, that you were working on with us before the show. Can you talk a little bit about it? Oh, yeah. No. So so right now I'm, 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 I'm going back to my writing roots. Um, I saw someone like, you know, bring back Brett to Insider. That would be awesome. Uh, but that's over in uh, England now with Titan Publishing and Jonathan Wilkins is doing a, a bang up job out there, but um, so yeah, I, I just recently penned uh, the art of Hotel Transylvania Two, which was um, a great. It was great. Well, it it was a three week. I, I wrote the book in three weeks, <laughs> essentially. Really, you wrote I, the book in three weeks? Yeah. So For Hotel Transylvania Two, uh, and, and and it entailed me going down to Sony uh, Animation Pictures to interview like eight people. One of them. One of whom happened to be Gendy Tartakovsky, who I oh. actually interviewed for the Insider Magazine for the very first Clone Wars cartoon. Actually, it was the second series. The second the season Wars. with General Grievous in it. Yes. I loved that Gendy micro series. Uh, I thought uh, it was incredible. It was great, man. Um, and, and just his, his sense of, of, of animation style. I mean, he's just a throwback. Oh, yeah. Uh, Samurai old Jack. School. Uh, you know, te- Tex Avery, Warner Brothers. Just a just a really sharp mind and just very stylistic and and I think I think and, and I really enjoy like I I like Hotel Transylvania but I really like any tar- like Samurai Jack mm-hmm. you know a uh, Dexter's Laboratory you know it's just, like his two D style and his sensibilities were just were just awesome and it it was actually great to be like hey yeah, I interviewed you ten years ago he's like oh yeah. But, you know, like he would remember because, you know, I'm just a little blip on the radar. But um, so I, I got to, yeah, I got to interview him and and go down there and, t- and talk about, you know, that th- uh, Hotel Transylvania 2. And so it's kind of it's kind of what I'm up to these days is just trying to get back into that writing groove. Um, because as much as I, I loved uh, managing spreadsheets, um, I really do uh, prefer writing. Uh, you know, it's kind of kind of the wheelhouse. It's kind of where I I started in my career and... I mean, I came to LucasArts as a manual writer for. Crying that's awesome. Out. That's that's great, man. Well, it's been it's been great to have you on. Uh, do you guys have any more questions for Brett? Uh, let us know. We're just kind of playing through Felucia here. You're in the belly of the Sarlacc. Ew, gross. Yeah, really disgusting. Um, oh, this was good times. Yeah, this was good times. A <clears throat> uh, little different than how we saw it on uh, Robot Chicken. Star yeah. Wars. You know what? <laughs> oh, I remember this cutscene. Um, you know what was really interesting about Hold uh, on. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. audio? <clears throat> Ain't no thing. Oh, there's no thing. Ain't yeah. no thing. So what was great about uh, speaking of Robot Chicken, I remember Are you there? when I really started to understand the reach of Force Unleashed was when uh, Seth Green and Matt Senreich and uh, some of the guys. Should I bring Manny on? You think? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Yeah. Hey, hey, Brett, do you want to hang with us for a bit longer? We're You're... just gonna bring some, uh, another guest on, yeah. or do you need to split? No, I'm 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 here with you guys, man. It's all, all right. good. Cool. We're bringing someone just asked me if I like Star Wars. <laughs> the <laughs> thing about Brett is he doesn't. He does not does like, Brett Star like Star Wars. Like no. yes, Star Wars. Brett Star Wars. is more of a Star Crash guy. He likes Star Crash better than he likes Star Wars. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Robert Corman. Um. Christopher Plummer, uh, David Hasselhoff. Don't know what that is. You ever heard the quote, Imperial Battleship, halt the flow of time. I only heard it once, and that was just now. Okay. Well, look it up on YouTube. Star okay. Crash is a Roger Corman ripoff of Star Wars that uh, nearly ended many careers, I guess. <laughs> well, we have, to, we have to watch. That's a good movie night. Yeah. We've got to do that movie yeah, Star, night. We, well, we tried, I, I think, for a second, and it, 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 just, it, 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 beat, it, it beat us. 
I, it, so someone just exists. asked me what my favorite level was in the game, and I really, I mean, there's so many to choose from, but I really love Raxus Prime. Hmm. Raxus Prime and is it, amazing. What do you love? What's your favorite thing about it? It was such a rich environment, and it was so deep, and 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 the golems, the the you know that that uh, Kazan Pratis was was raising. Like it was just such a it was such a challenge too. I that, that I I remember that level being a a pretty big <clears> challenge for us to kind of bring to life. And and Chris McGee was was the was, I think the 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 lead designer on that level, and he he just did a great job with that. I mean. When you're thinking about like raising, you know, body parts or droid parts and 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 connecting them through the force, like, I mean, and I th I think I don't even know if Kaz and Pratis gets his due as much as he should because he he was like the crazy Jedi. We had the whole like the mock Jedi Council like in 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 metal form, mm -hmm. and he's just like up there getting crazy. He's just crazy little man with his little spidery arms. And uh, and I and Raxus was was a really that's a really fun level to play. It really is, yeah. yeah. I, it was one of my favorite levels too. I mean, just visually, it was just stunning, and and uh, yeah, it was really really good time. I'm actually glad that we get to go back to it here in a second. Um, uh, we have Manny coming on in a second. Are there any, any other questions for uh, for Brett here? Oh, here's one. What are your thoughts on the Jar Jar being a complete badass and Sith Lord in the prequels, including changes to scripts and Jar Jar's style of fighting? Oh yeah, no. Uh, yeah. Well, you actually, that? that that was something that I remember when I came on the project um, and di and just kind of riffing with Hayden, and he was telling me about story meetings that he went into, um, and and about the original character of Jar Jar. Because I don't know if a lot of people know this, but um, and maybe I'm I'm stepping out of turn saying this, but but Hayden was the original Leland Chi. Yes, he, mm -hmm. he yes, was yes. the one. He was the one that was amassing basically the holocron and the information. And so he got he was privy to a lot of these story meetings, you know, On the during Phantom the Menace. prequels. And and for for uh the Phantom Menace, like Jar Jar was was initially supposed to be some really creepy, awesome monster that that doesn't look anything like he does now. But you know, somewhere along the way, you know, George changed his mind and and turned Jar Jar from this menacing character into something more slapstick. Hmm. Um and I and not being privy to those meetings, I don't, I don't know at what point <clears throat> they swapped. But um, I, you know, it, 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 there were there were a lot of interesting things that, that Hayden had told me about the script for the prequels that potentially would have made for a better, like, action-driven movie. Let's mm -hmm. say, you know, we we all know what George is going for when he was doing these movies and kind of filling in the backstory and we, we get to see, you know, kind of the, the story arc of Vader and the rise and the fall, um, and then the redemption. Um, but so, you know, I, 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 I love where George went with the story, to be honest, like, I, I don't want to be an apologist for it, but you know, I, I like what we got with the prequels. You know, I think there could have been some things that maybe could have been more faster paced, but in, in some of these original, um, script decisions, would probably have been more well received from fans, but mm -hmm. no. Simon, is that you? Is that who's no? Hey, that, that, that <laughs> inside story brought to you by Hot Pockets, guys. <laughs> Manny Lamas, Manny is Lamas, joined. ladies hey. and gentlemen, Manny. <laughs> Manny, we're with Re we're, we're with, with Brett uh, Rector. Brett Rector. I'm listening to Mr. Brett Rector, and uh, dude, like you guys were talking about his toy collection, his Star Wars collection. You guys like don't have an idea of that what that actually means to Brett. Like he's got, <laughs> I think he's up to two storages now, but that he can't fit in his house where he's got all his Star Wars stuff. <laughs> but but right now I'm sitting at at, at at my new table, and 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 I'm surrounded by all my friends. I see my Repu I, I see Republic Commando guys over here. I see I see. Uh -oh. some Cooper's. I've seen that picture, sir. Brett, <laughs> Brett actually right sent now. me a picture. He's actually at a Starbucks hey, look, it's, it's, right now. He's his son. <laughs> he's yeah. He, he's at a Starbucks right now, surrounded by um, you know all of his toys and just talking very loudly. And everyone's just kind of quietly like, "What is he? What, <laughs> what, what is going? On? I brought all my toys and I'm doing a live stream. Everybody, shut up! Calm shut down! Shut up! Calm down! No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so uh, there, there's a guy out there, Rogue Lieutenant. I am not confirming that that Jar Jar was supposed to be a Sith Lord. I'm I. I do not confirm that. I'm only conf I'm only saying oh, that he was going to be a around, more yeah. he was yeah. going to be a more rumors vicious, dangerous character. Yeah, uh, than he was uh, portrayed. You know, 
Just because he did a few flips into the water in Naboo? Like, Dude, like, he does oh, a yeah, couple exactly. flips and everyone thinks he's a... You know, yeah, um, what's that? You, you, Hayden was, a, was so interesting to talk to because he knew all this stuff. Like, he told me things that were in, you know, like, that were in early story docs for prequels and stuff that he was privy to that, I mean, it's... They showed up in, in Clone Wars. A lot of these ideas kept getting recycled and certain mm. little moments that... That I thought, oh, it's too bad that it didn't show up anywhere, and then it shows up in Clone Wars because George just kind of mm. George never lets an idea go. He just finds the right place for it. I mean, if you read, for example, the um, the comic book adaptation of the Star Wars, the original mm -hmm. script, um, the prequels and the original trilogy are all in there in terms mm -hmm. of little idea germs and stuff like that. Even Anakin and Padme and all those things are all. Right. Right. It's very interesting how he he really kind of comes up with that stuff. Yeah, because Hayden was on Episode 1 Insider's Guide. That's right. Which is, it was, I miss the Insider's Guide stuff. Of course, that was back in the days of CD-ROM, but I loved how the, the depth of that, of that stuff, the Star Wars Insider's Guide in Episode 1. But we should, I, we should introduce everybody to Manny. And, yeah, and Manny, say, who are you? Manny Lamas, you, you're here. You're, you talk about your role on The Force Unleashed and how you and Brett Rector were best buds. I don't I just threw that. that well, it all in, started but, when the mouse crawled up Maddie's leg at 3 a.m., Oh my god, dude! What? Oh my dude! So we had a Lucas Christmas Mouse. Still to bring that that stuff up since that. <laughs> so wait, wait. The Lucas Mouse was a real thing. It was, was a real. A okay, so remember I told you about the snack oh, room. Oh, so Sam's heard about this. Oh yeah, but I thought it was like a little plushie or something. Like, hey, it's a no, Lucas no. Mouse. There was a mouse oh, problem no, 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 that broke okay. out so, during well, it, development. It, it grabbed uh, hold of the leg and it, it, it crawled up. Oh no! There's there's. <laughs> there's <a story. laughs> So Go first ahead. of all, I'm Manny. I was uh, one of the senior character artists for Force Unleashed One uh, and Two. I uh, helped uh, design some parts of the Star Killer costumes, and I actually sculpted and uh, modeled, textured, and went uh, through a lot of the other uh, costumes for different planets for him as well as other secondary characters, Proxy, uh, Darth Maul. Which there's a story there too. We'll have to get back to the Darth Maul story and how we actually got that guy into the game. Uh, but the mouse story, which is nobody has forgotten this. So we're working, like you guys have been talking about, I was working like crazy amounts of, you know, like overtime or, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I was, you, you weren't told that you had to come into work, but so many of us, you know, stayed there extra hours and all these. Yeah, extra it wasn't time. mandated. It extra was just, things yeah. that were not even like supposed to be doing you know, things like, no, let's try and get this stuff in. People like it. We'll get that stuff in. So one night, I think it was like three, four, three in the morning, something like that, something crazy time at the night. And I think it was just me. Somebody else, I don't, I don't remember who it was, because there was three people. Certainly, that were no their producers ass. were around because it was past our bedtime. Right, right. Yeah, we put you guys to bed at that point yeah. already. <laughs> so Except it, for Hayden, who was driving around at four a.m. Yeah, yeah. Looking well, he was for David. For David, David yeah. Fallen. <laughs> There's change on the floor. Anyone that sounds like Pick change. Pick up the change on the floor. Honk, honk. Change on the floor. <laughs> Picks up a prostitute. Yeah. Like if you guys know Hayden, you'd be laughing your butts too. You knew, yeah. like, just imagine him doing that at night. But the, so the mouse, you're there at three in the so, morning. Yeah. So yourself. Mike, K, uh, yeah, Mike Hale was was there, myself and somebody else. Because I remember we were just laughing our butts off at that point. And uh, there was, you know, like we had so many people in the team. You guys have spoken about this as well. That you know, like you guys brought in all that candy. You guys were talking about all the food. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, not everybody was super concise about keeping it all in. Topperware like they were supposed to, you know, and everybody goes, you know, like development time or whatever. So th these people started like leaving it outside, not really taking care of it. Some of the windows were left open at night when they went home. So some mice got into the Lucas building and it became a huge thing. With, huge you know, like, problem. Every, every morning, you know, we get an email. It's like, you know, make sure you have your Tupperware set up. You know, make sure you close your windows when you go home at night. And I'd be walking, walking around at night, you know, working really late and I see all the windows open. I see candy on everybody's desk, and I'm like, "You guys, what? Like, come on!" <laughs> so totally. That's what, uh, sorry. I just said totally. Yeah, absolutely. No, but go ahead. Right? Yeah. So yeah. As uh, we're working late, I I, don't, I wish I remember what I was working on at that point. I'm just, some textures, I'm sure, some crazy stuff for a character. Uh, so I feel something around my ankle, <laughs> or around my feet, a couple of times, right? And I was like, you "Okay." That was no, me saying, "Manny, did you get your work done?" <laughs> was that your friend? In the spreadsheet. <laughs> like, we no. that, Just, you, I've got a Brett Rector crawling up my leg. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, the you Java producer for that though. <laughs> hey now, this is a family <laughs> show. Yeah. So the uh, the the thing about the C building was that, which is where the team was located. Yeah, it was a giant mouse problem, and mm -hmm. the Presidio had this um, 
had this floating floor with the with the air conditioning vents coming up underneath it and a bunch of mice were just under the floor and of course found the snack room and yeah so you had one crawl up your leg at, at three well, in the morning yeah well i mean i felt something on my leg at first right and i was like i was well aware of the mouse bro i actually saw a few mice when i like every now and then if you run into the kitchen and you turn on the light you would scurry. see yeah. a mouse just scatter and run for his life somewhere and you're like did he just run into the, the toaster and they were like going into the toaster to get all the crumbs or they even lived on the toaster. I don't think people even used the toaster at that point, but it was so warm around that area that there was mice just running into the toaster every time I turned on the light for a little bit. I mean, we got rid of the mice, obviously. It's not like Lucas is a shut down place or whatever. Right? But uh, anyways, uh, as I, you know, I, I, I felt that by my foot. I'm like, no, nah, there's, there's no way that there's, there's, a, there's a mouse that close, right? Those things get scared like that light or sound that anything people around, right? I was like, all right, I'm just going to keep working, whatever. I looked around, there was nothing. And then another time, I, I feel a little bit more like, oh, my God. And it went up my jeans. And I started <laughs> going upwards on my leg in a spiral motion. And I'm just like, holy shit. I jumped out of my chair and I grabbed uh, like my upper thigh to constrict the amount of movement that this mouse would be able to do. So he couldn't, my jeans. So he couldn't get to your junk. <laughs> Uh, yes, essentially. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Fair I stopped enough. him just before that, and I, I remember moving right by my hands. I'm just like, oh my, fucking, oh my god! Like I just start jumping around and just shaking my jeans and my my legs for the, the next three minutes. And my kid was stands up, takes off his headset. He always worked with headsets on, and he's like, oh, what's going on? I was like, dude, a mouse! There's a mouse! There's effing mouse! <laughs> whatever. So that shook out, and I don't know if you guys, I'm sure everybody has at least one friend that does a little bit of art, you know, whether they're like going to school for it or they have a professional friend that does art. But, you know, at least one person of your friends that has an artist and something, you know, something messed up has, happens to your group of friends. That's, that's that one person's going to Photoshop something up and send it around <laughs> to the rest of the group of your friends. The course. Photoshop, now, I would love to now, see some now, of the Photoshop. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, go now, ahead. Go ahead. Imagine an entire studio of artists. <laughs> and then they're handed this little piece of gold story and just yeah the next for the next five days there's just photoshops of uh like mice going into jeans there was like little diagrams so this like, is how i know the mouse and, oh my god i've seen yeah. the art i just didn't think oh, i was like oh he's like an, a mascot excellent awesome well, so, <laughs> yeah i mean we're here we are we've moved into a federal into a facility in the middle of a federal park Right. I mean, it's, I mean, and and it's so new that this is the first time that it happened. Right. We've been in we've been in that facility for like a year and a half, and suddenly yeah. the first time a mice problem breaks out, like all, everyone in the facility is trying to figure out how to deal with it. Like it was it was a very new building, you know. Well, okay, it was a new building, but here now that we're going off the beaten path a little bit, it was a new building. It's the Letterman <laughs> Digital Arts Center, and it was built uh, on the former site of the Letterman Hospital on yes. the Presidio. Yes. So it's reputed reputedly. Uh, very haunted. Haunted, yes. I remember there was an email going around about, so if I'm, you know, if I'm working late at night and blood starts trickling down my monitor, is that a facilities call or an IT call? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you can you always know, call production. Yeah, and, call production. Know, we, That's, call Brett, he'll figure it out. Amy Beth Christensen, <laughs> Amy Beth Christensen, who does not believe in, in ghosts, who, who were, by the way, she's going to try to get on this uh, this little podcast. Oh, not at all. No, she, yeah, she no. does not believe in ghosts, but she, no. she told me, she's like, Sam, I don't believe in ghosts. But I had a weird thing happen to me the other day. I'm like, what's that? She's like, well, I was in the fitness center, and I was in the uh, in the locker room, and you know, I was just toweling off and this and that, and then I watched a towel float down the middle of the locker room and then just drop. So she's like, I don't know what that is, but I left. <laughs> yeah, good call. <laughs> she's like, I left. She's like, yeah, I watched the towel float <laughs> float down it. the room like it was just floating, and, and then and then it just dropped. And she's like, that's not that's not she's a thing. No. She's driven through a ghost before as well. She told me, so I think she be, she totally believes in ghosts now. Yeah, I think I think that probably and changes like, your what? mind. It's like yeah, she like she drove through a ghost. It's like I don't know, if, you know, you're probably not gonna believe me. And I was like, I I kind of don't, but holy crap! There's like, there's, there's, there's Amy right there. Look and, and her left. skepticism. Look at and the she's skepticism. got a ghost right next to she's her, which ghost, is crazy. Which is it's funny. It's like well, there she is. You it's know? right. There. I don't believe in her. No, oh, that's she's right next to her. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Um, and, and you know, I, w I was just kind of um, I, I was looking through the book that I wrote the, these many years ago, and I was thinking about um, some of our choices that we made as far as lightsabers go. Um, kind of the backward stance for Star Killer was mm -hmm. something new in Star Wars. Like no one ever had had a, had a lightsaber that was backwards. Um, with Maris Brood, we had Tonfas. Like right. there were some there were some really cool things just from. You know, kind of going back to our conversation about not necessarily canon, but um, 
just some of the cool things that we did with these characters. And, and I would like to think, because Dave Filoni, he was new at the time and he was developing Clone Wars, I'd like to think that, that he took a couple of cues for ah uh, Ahsoka oh, well, yeah. from, from our character. Well, let me... Backwards. Let me, you know, there's, there's, there's an interesting thing with Star Wars where there are a lot of ideas that by coincidence or by osmosis kind of get passed around to certain things. For example, we talked about how there's a whole level in this game where you travel through a junk planet to find a Jedi, a mad Jedi with, with spider, spider legs. legs. Mm-hmm. And you're like, you know, I, that sounds familiar. You know, like, yeah. like, and that was also the Darth Maul story, although we did it differently when we did it that way. And, and, uh, and, and also I'm went to a, you bring that up, Sam, because when I was watching those particular episodes, I was like, wow. This feels a lot like Rax's Rax prime. prime. Yeah, exactly. And I yeah. remember I got that. talking to Matt Mishnovitz about that, and he's just like, "What?" It's like, "Yeah, mm-hmm. man, this like, this like Rax's Prime. That's like what we did in the game, like in 08. There's, there's also some other stuff coming in Rebels that is reminiscent of some Force Unleashed stuff. Um, oh. Also, in Clone Wars, we saw uh, Force Repulse. We saw um, Savage Press. Press do a force repulse. We saw Asajj Ventress do a force repulse, and they they animated it the way that we animated it, where you spread your arms apart like that. And, I, I, just and, one thing about Dave Filoni, he's he's really good at at kind of everything. paying homage. Yeah, well, he's really good at paying homage to stuff. And he was, you know, at the time, you know, the divisions were very separate, and he was always trying to find ways to bring things together. And and one of the, I I thought it was so great that he brought you and Adrian in on the Mortis trilogy, for example, right. for just for this reason to kind of share the Star Wars love and and. And, uh, you know, create some, I guess, some consistency with how, how things look. And, like, if he saw something cool in Force Unleashed, he used it. You know, he brought Delta Squad in from Republic Commando. Right. Uh, he, 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 by named, the way, he, he wanted Sith, to. Which is Night Sisters. You know, that all there that There was stuff. a consideration for a while. He wanted to bring Coda, uh, have, right. give him a small appearance in Clone Wars. That would, that would be awesome. Which would have been, you know, I would have loved to see young General Coda with his crew of non-clones. You and your clones. Bring him into trust- Rebels. Yeah, bring him into could. Rebels. He'd be blind. I, I remember running into him on the at the dining comments a few times, and every time you know he talks Star Wars, he's all about him and he knows everything. So I, yeah. I would talk to him about little things here and there, and yeah. every now and then I would try and sneak in, you know, the, the, try, try to plant the seed of having like a Star Killer, you know, show up somewhere down the line in some show that he'd be working. Well, on, you so. know, the thing is, if Star Killer would ever show up in Rebels, it's got to be because the thing that he's doing well is he's doing his own version of things, right? Mm. So, and then we've talked about this. You know, Star Killer drags a Star Destroyer out of the sky, right? Which is a pretty cannon-breaking thing. No, but- no, he 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 persuaded the the pilots to crash it down. I don't even know just what happened there. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, oh, our brains it, just exploded. Uh, our <laughs> brains exploded. Manny had, had finally cracked it. That the Star Destroyer is, did get pulled on. Pull it out of the sky. He's like, well, Coda, there's a guy at the steering wheel. Yeah. Why don't I just? The I already yeah. have this power. We're like, yeah, why would yeah. I try and pull out the whole thing? Pull it out of the sky. Pull it out of the sky. I'm gonna do it, it anyway. <laughs> um, by the way, just but while we're talking about Coda, I the thing that I love about Hayden Blackman is his different riffs on. Because all of the Star Wars characters in a lot of these things are riffs on original characters, right? Star Killer is kind of Han Solo and Luke Skywalker uh, put together. But I love that General Coda is your Obi Wan Kenobi for the game, and instead of the you know use the, wise, yes. use the Force, I will provide you hope and We're inspiration. Going to do things very slowly. We're he's going to be talking. He's like the this. alcoholic uh, football coach. He's, Go out there and win, boy. Win, boy. Boy, come on, you know. Boy. He's, so he's he's you know he abuses you into doing the right thing. Quick force unleashed drinking game. Every time Coda says "boy," take a shot. That's right. Oh my you God. will not Dude, last very long. Too. I mean, we're not. Are, are we it. starting now? <laughs> I've, I've <already> <laughs> he's drunk. He's already <laughs> drunk. <laughs> are we starting yeah. now? I've been doing this. Oh, since it's the drunken <laughs> rebel pilot. I've been doing this since Dark Forces. <laughs> uh, every time someone says the word 
Blast me, blast him. Hold him off for a few seconds. Just hold it off a little longer. <laughs> almost there. I've, I, almost drunk. I, I just puked three times. I gotta I start over. I drunk hand solo with you guys every time. <laughs> Dude, it's it's either it's him and Porkins, and that, that attack was never supposed to succeed. They're like, oh God. look, guys, we're actually gonna do an evacuation. Just send send that guy and Porkins <laughs> up there, and it'll be fine. Look He's already out there. It's <laughs> look at these just clones. Follow, just follow Porkins. Look at all these dead clones here, man. This is nuts. I know. And, always... and I know. I know. Uh, Hayden really did like the the character of Qui Gon Jinn. So I think Coda is really. Mm. He, he's a little bit more. He's like in the Qui Gon kind of. Samurai. Like, yeah. Yeah. We, just like throw. We you got, know what? I, I'm going to take a chance cause... on this kid. He he is strong in the Force. We're going to take this guy. So I mean. And and I know at the time, like Hayden, you know, he, he was he would he liked the movie Taken, and he was you know he's very instead of skills. So yeah, I mean I it's and Coda are. is just really he's just that kind of you know for Hayden it was just like the badass Jedi that yeah. they yeah. can that can live outside in the in, in you know kind of like the 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 ant, not not even the anti hero he's not quite you know obviously Boba Fett or anything like that but. You know, Coda is, has got that edge to him. I mean, he was a drunk. Yeah. You know, Starkiller found him in Bespin and brought him back. And it's, you know, it, it, it was just, that's just a character type that Hayden really enjoys and really likes. And and that's what I like about Hayden and his characters in general, whether it's in Batwoman or Elektra. Like, Hayden's just got a really good sense uh, for, like, character development. And, and I thought Coda was, was – he's – He's one of the greatest characters that you know we've had in in, in Star Wars. In Star Wars, you know, the, Hayden Blackman also has this uncanny understanding of Darth Vader. For example, if you've read for Ghost Star Prison. Wars fans, yes, everyone go out there and go on Amazon and buy Darth Vader and the Ghost Prison, and it is one of the best Darth Vader stories I've ever read. And it's it's just Hayden Blackman understanding that character and understanding what he goes through. There's actually this one thing that he does in this other thing. It wasn't the Ghost Prison. But I think he he took an idea that I gave him because I, when there was the notion of taking Darth Vader hostage, taking Darth Vader captive and and wanting to put him on trial, um, I said, would they disem would they disassemble Darth Vader, because they're so afraid of him? Would they literally like take him apart and that's the way that they they keep him together? And there could be this cool sequence where he puts himself back together and then hunts them all down. Oh. Um, yeah, but but just there was something really grisly about the idea of taking Frankenstein apart because you're afraid of what Frankenstein is going to do, and then and not realizing, it's not his arms or his legs that make him powerful. It's it's his it's mind and his hatred, and yeah. uh, and so in one of the um, comics that Hayden wrote, there's a scene where Darth Vader is being cleaned. It's like is the shower scene for Darth Vader, but they strip <laughs> off all of, they strip off all of the uh, the suit. And they take apart all those cybernetic parts, and he's sort of suspended in this this room by wires, and it's apparently this extraordinarily painful, painful. process as they mm -hmm. clean all of his systems out, and he he's mumbling to himself, and and the droid says, "What was that, Lord Vader?" He's like, "Keep me sane," and uh, oh. he's thinking about Padme the whole time and freaking out while they're cleaning him. It was just this really grisly sequence that I'd like to think I gave him the germ of that idea by saying, "Would they disassemble Darth Vader?" You know, one of the things that's seen in Robocop. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, or both of them in the, the remake and in the original. Yeah, yeah. Even, well, yeah, the remake was even creepier, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, yes. Speaking of Qui Gon, we actually got him into the game as a DLC character. That's right. Uh, after the game, uh, we finished the game. Uh, we then came out with a gold edition of uh, Force Unleashed, and then we had like all this DLC content in a few levels and uh, a crap load of characters that we had to do. And when we were given this list of some of the ideas, so the characters are, you know, that people wanted to see from from the dev team, you know, the list was ridiculously like everybody has like favorite characters that they want to play as through the Force Unleashed, right? So as we saw this list, we're like, okay, you know, we can we can do some of these, and they're like, you know what, let's do them all. And we're like, you can see like four character artists just like looking at each other, going, uh, do you want to? You know, can we do this? Is this gonna be doable? So we had to shorten our development time for the characters to three weeks. Per character for the DLC. No way. So we're, we're like, yeah, if we thought crunching during the actual game was tough, DLC was insane for us character artists. Wow. Wow. I remember losing a, a big argument <clears throat> with Julio about this. And this is this is a great example of producers, you know, keeping their eye on. And actually, you know, looking back on it, uh, I side with Julio on this because, um, and this has to do with DLC costumes. He didn't tell me 
that this was happening for the longest time. He just kind of kept me focused on the game because he knew that I would want to go in and do unique sound sets for every character. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we didn't have the tech to do that, and it's such a huge task, and it would have been yeah. so time-consuming and expensive. And, of course, you know, you guys had already moved on to that stuff. We were still, you know, chasing bugs and stuff, and he, he just kind of omitted it. And I, I remember being pretty upset about it, you know, thinking, well, you know, you've got, you've got like, Proxy, and you've got Republic Commandos, and you've got Darth Maul, and you still have all the same Starkiller sound sets and all the Star Killers grunts. Kid Fisto, Kid the Fisto, Dark yeah. Apprentice that ripped apart Apprentice. Yeah. And they all have the same sound set, and it's just because it was one of those things where, you know, like I said, the sound was so behind, and so he made a tough decision, um, kind of knowing that I was in the middle of it all, and he just said, you know what, we, we can't do it. And I eventually, I eventually agreed, but... I remember thinking, oh man, these things look so amazing. Like, I want to just do all the sound for it, and can we record all the act? No. That would have been so amazing. But, but yeah, it would have I mean, taken another doubling, three months. Tripling, quadrupling the amount of work that you guys have to do. I mean, the circular yeah. has so many lines that. You have so many lines, so many sounds, like all the footsteps, all the foley, all the, the lightsabers. You know, these characters have unique lightsaber sounds, you yeah. know. Um, so, yeah, I remember. Also, the, the sound of Liam Neeson's brow alone. As it as it pushes air out of the way, like it's that, quite impressive. Look at that nose. I want Look to do some the, improvisational <laughs> comedy now. I want to do some improvisational comedy. Train now. Those are closed. trade secrets, man. <laughs> yeah, a particular set of skills. I will find you. <laughs> I will find you. And I will force choke you, or at least throw this seed pot at you. I am Dark Man. <laughs> oh, but yeah, out of all those like costumes, we even uh, got to speak with the, uh, Dave Filoni. We got to do a version of. Uh, a Clone Wars version of Star Killer in there, which was really, really interesting to do. Let's let's show your work, Manny. I don't, I don't think I put an image of that in there. Oh, Manny, Manny. I, what? You don't think I have the power? Oh, I probably sent it to you years ago. <laughs> bro, bro, are you watching the the Twitch stream? Well, there's a delay, but I'll have to wait a few, like twenty seconds to to. My friend. Did Someone? you load the actual character? You probably loaded. Yeah, it. we did. We loaded Darth. Or okay. Quite yeah. <laughs> Here's the Clone Wars version of of Star Killer. And do, like creating your face in that style was actually we went through like I think three revisions to that thing because you know like uh, other characters jumped in there like oh you know fix this little area this area then this you know the style that we hadn't done in the, on the team at that point you know like this was uh, you know, the animation Lucas animation was doing all that stuff right. so I had to kind of jump in there and like you know deep end is like here let's tr try and do a clone version of this like okay well let's 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 do it three times <laughs> until we got it kind of you know as best as we could in those three weeks <laughs> yeah well you you did a well I died. That's fine. But you did a really good job. <laughs> uh, but that's yeah. It's that I, I got a being a Clone Wars fan. I was I oh was, there he is. I'm just you know. Yeah. Which you know it's funny. The thing that I get all the time when when I'm like at cons and I have a there's like a picture of like for example um, uh, the son of Mortis with Anakin and people always go yeah that looks just like you and they're pointing at Anakin. And I'm like <laughs> no <laughs> that's, not, that's not that's <laughs> not it's not me. <laughs> um, but it's it's interesting that the, there is some not really a little resemblance to Anakin in the face, but not really. I'm glad you got the chin right though. Very yeah, happy actually, about that. Uh, Amy Beth did a really awesome concept in Clone Wars style of you, and then you know we went off that and we did revisions for the 3D model, so it all worked out you know back and forth, and it yeah like she, she did a great job. Yeah, yeah, very very good. Um, should we show one more model before we go back yeah. to Starkiller? Yeah. What's sure. another good model you want us to look at, Manny? Oh, I think uh, if there's like some hardcore Star Wars fans in here, they probably get a kicked up seeing like the. I think uh, you should play as Proxy. The, the yeah. Darth Sion. All right, well, let's, I, let's I did Proxy as well, but yeah, the Darth Sion is something that I think the Darth Sion the guys will actually recognize. Because because I don't I don't think Dave Collins gets enough love. Let's ever. let's do so, okay. Here's where is Proxy? He's got to be in there, isn't he? I thought he yeah, was. Oh, you yeah, haven't you haven't unlocked Proxy. him yet? Combat, combat training, training droid, lightsaber training droid. Son so of Proxy a was kind of uh, difficult Very, to yes. do it at first because we had like a poly count per character model. That. So that means you have this many polygons to put all the detail and with whatever the signs you know the team came up with to actually sculpt out the model. You know, with the vertices and just polygons and everything. Here, really so quick, I want to I want to point out oh. this one. This version of the Sith Assassin, which is built on the star, it's the Star Killer Sith Assassin. It looks like the son mm -hmm. of Mortis. Mm -hmm. The paint yes. styles. It's like I thought that was really interesting. Where it's like, oh, that's. You know, it's me as the son of Mortis in a, in a weird way. Um, all right, where, what are we doing? Inquisitor, you know, like Commando. a little foreshadow. Oh, that's an Imperial Inquisitor. Commando, never mind. Oh, with the test tubes? And it looks like the Inquisitor, yeah. Yeah, that one's really creepy. We almost, we thought that that was something going to get in because we went a little, 
we went pretty far on how gory that guy was, but I mean, we we, we carved up his entire torso and stomach, and we replaced his lungs with this with the Specta tanks that we changed the color of so it fit more of the character. There were actually we started with the initial uh, green Specta tank kind of kind of designing those lungs, and we changed them to red there, as you can see. But yeah, we ripped out your eye and your jaw is completely missing. We have tubes going into uh, your body. There's wires representing the muscle Ouch. structure inside. I mean, yeah, it was just a mess. We didn't think that was going to really go through licensing, but they're like, yep, they're fine with it. We're like, what? Really? Well, wow. this was always a darker Star Wars anyway. Like, it was... It, everyone kind of understood that when this was coming out that they were going to allow this to be darker than... Well, I mean, I guess Revenge of the Sith just came out, so they were kind of like, okay, look, we've we've been to some some hardcore places you guys can get away with a few things sure but the entire process of the game we we were battling you know with licensing back and forth on whether we could have like you know cutting limbs off and decapitations and those and all these things you know like there's something that we're worried from day one i'm sure uh brett can talk about this a little bit farther than me but you know going into fortune leagues 2 that became a huge push for us and then we eventually got that to go through in a different ways well, if and that, that was a huge first, it was just robots if they didn't actually show the heads you know all those things no, that was a huge effort, Manny, to just crib off Manny's point. To, to get decapitations was a big thing with, like, ESRB. Mm -hmm. Because you can kind of think about it, again, going back to, like, any Tartakovsky and Samurai Jack. The only, the only things that he was cutting limbs off were, you know, quote-unquote robots. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, if we look at the stormtroopers, it's like, well, they kind of look like robots. They don't, you know, necessarily, you know... Maybe they're humanoid, maybe they're not. Anyway, so that's kind of how we got around it because they almost look like robots. Ro robotic, and, and, yeah, you never got to Yeah, it's, it's not like, it's like, oh, it's conceivable that it's not actually a person in there, but, you know, obviously it was. Yeah, yeah. Like we just blackened out the inside anyways when the heads rolled, for the, the TF2 anyways. Uh, but yeah, you never saw like any gore or blood or like char from skin or anything like that. So they were okay with that. And it actually worked in our favor because Star Wars has, you know, all this... All the stormtroopers in every single level, and we could, you know, that's where you go. You got to see all that stuff, and we wanted to do it for TFU one, but we, we we just couldn't do it at that point. Um, hey, Manny, can and we actually, talk speak to that. Back go in ahead. The, like many, many, many years ago, I worked on Counter Strike, this little game you might have heard of that Bob Software made many years ago, and I back then I was doing a little bit of contract for them, and they built they they were doing a German version of Counter Strike, and I was tasked to do robots. For Counter Strike for the German version, so that they could actually have them, you know, shooting each other and whatever. At that point, the German, I don't know, their own ESRB, whatever that is over there, did not want that game to be published the way it was. Mm. Wow. Well, yeah, they, they, they always, they, they, as, a, as a territory, they, they're very sensitive to. Brett, did you, I mean, are you in the bathroom? Or two. Is that? So, Brett? so Germany just is oh. a country and just what they allowed to, to be seen in their country is very much influenced by, you know, what happened in the past, so... We're, yeah, we're, getting, we're getting deep, guys. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's getting deep. deep. But, but that's, that's the things that we had to think about at, from a production standpoint. Like, all right, so we can't have, you know, if there's going to be blood, then it can't be red, it has to be green. Wow. You know, and that, and that, yeah, and that yeah, was yeah. in other games, <laughs> not just for our game. Yeah. But, but yeah, we, we always okay. had to... We always had to keep that in mind as we were as we were making games at the studio. Yeah, and that's one thing they brought up on the on the in the chat room here is that you know lightsabers cauter cauterize wounds, which uh, yeah. is kind of a saving grace for us in terms of uh, Force Unleashed Two. Um, do you have any comments about some of the this costume, this Darth Maul costume? And then someone asked uh, Manny which Republic commando that was, but it's an Imperial commando; it's its own design. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Which which commando? There was an Imperial commando costume that we were playing as, and someone uh, in the chat asked which Republic commando was that. But it's an Imperial. Oh commando. man, you know, <laughs> I actually I'm probably one of the few people that did not play through all of Republic commando, so I don't know. Like, Whoa. The, Whoa. Oh, oh my god! How dare you do? Hey. <laughs> Your what license is has just been revoked. You're you out. Chat room <laughs> immediately. So yeah, I'm not familiar with the four Republic Commandos. I mean, anything else Star Wars I can I can talk about well, endlessly. Well, I mean, but Republic Commando was one thing of with you Republic that Commandos. Funny. It wasn't just the four of them. Like there was, you know, that's kind of what they look like. So and and I and I actually but, but there were the heroes. Called yeah. them Imperial Commandos. Well, this was um, an Imperial Commando costume. Makes sense at this point because you know it's not it's not the Republic it's, it's, anymore. It's, it's, <laughs> But, no, uh, but I, I mean, the, the only thing that we really put in there, like we actually grabbed one of those helmets and we were asked to do uh, some like little Easter eggs. So I remember we uh, cutting up some of those helmets and actually scattered them about some of the levels. In this one, you see a lot of clone troopers, but there's also a Republic Commander 
helmet hitting in one of these levels as well. I remember. I would believe I mean, that was in the demo, but I don't think it's in the actual game. It, it's in it's in the Tie Fighter uh, facility. But I think it's Tie Fighter. Okay. There, there, no, there's an Easter egg of a Republic Commando helmet, and yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm spacing on the artist's name, but he worked on Republic Commando, and he and he was he wasn't one of the he was actually on the indie game that was being done concurrently when we were doing Force Unleashed. Was it Carl? Uh, but we brought this guy over, and again, I, no. I'm spacing on his no. name, but he put that up on, on this ledge and and no one knew about it for a long time and then someone got up there and they're like what is this Republic commando helmet that's so like when you find a that. lightsaber in republic commando right. <laughs> it's kind of a nice i'll, I'll jump in and talk about darth maul in a second but i just to to talk about the backwards lightsaber that i forgot to mention when you guys were uh, talking about it earlier um a little Easter egg that sam actually puts into some of his movies you'll notice him like in oh uh, yes. yes in yes, the yes. mist You'll actually see him like holding his knife backwards in the Star Killer uh, homage right there, and I was like, I saw that, in, you know, that when I watched the movie, and I, I was do like, that. I, I, yeah, I called it out. I was like, Sam, that's like true Star Wars fan right there. Man. Well, there was through, man. in season two of Being Human. There's a point where I'm fighting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a point where I'm fighting some some vampires, and I have a stake, and they have a stake, and at some point I take the stake away from one of them, and I have two of them, and I made sure that the camera, because the camera was behind me, so I made sure to hold them both. And you know, I and love that. And, and, I, and I got him to be Force Unleashed to like ready position before we continue the fight. So it's <laughs> so in the, a in the side beginning story. of season two, being human, you see a little Star Killer moment. A little side story here. So I remember, I was I remember going to meet you to run lines before we shot this Force Unleashed, uh -huh. right? And so you we were running lines on this before we the night before we shot this. Remember this? We you know I came and met you and we were running lines. Uh, and then but you had a copy of the Mist next to you yes and i was and because you had just booked the mist and so you went straight from force unleashed over to the mist over to the mist mm -hmm. and you and you shot the mist like the following weeks yes after after force and that's why you look so much like star killer in the mist in the mist yeah and um, didn't grow any grow any hair for the mist unfortunately but i remember later on we went to go see the mist in san francisco you are visiting and so we went to go see it and when that happened you you went like this you went like that and pointed at the screen and I was just like oh like I, I had to like not I had to stop myself from not whooping out loud I was like you son of a you bitch you son of a bitch yeah 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 that's a great point Manny I'm glad you brought that uh, up yeah I remember this story that Sam told me and he's I remember you, you you asked the director if you could do it that way and it's like yeah yeah it's fine but you, I don't think you told him why right no of course not no yeah yeah but it's like yeah, the fact that you got in there Frank and Frank Dillabon well man that's beautiful I love that yeah yeah, no, I, I, I say, Sam, I, w I was very sad at, at your demise in the mist, your character's demise. Yeah, he it's, didn't. It didn't. It, it didn't go me. well. It didn't go well. But I love yeah. the Sev handprint on the glass door. The yeah. Sev handprint. <laughs> I'm just calling it that. That's not what it is, but it is now. That was something that that I came up with, because yeah. uh, originally he was going to be pulled out into the mist, and a spray of body parts was going to hit the window. And oh. I and I said to Frank, I'm like, well, this is really the the turning point of the movie, where it's no longer a fun monster movie. And it becomes sort of something more personal and, and a little bit more terrifying. So we've already had the gory stuff. Let's do something more personal that stays with us for the rest of the movie. Let's just have him lay a handprint on the window. And and Frank was like, yeah, let's do that. Which I was like, what? Really? <laughs> that was cool. Just kidding, but... Yeah, I know. I, have no, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not you. <laughs> so, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. But, That's awesome. Uh, hey, Manny, what were some of the um, big challenge? Like, I, I want to know. I, here's what I want to know for for this is the challenge I'm going to give Manny and Brett. I want to know the moments where you thought, "Oh my God, we're never going to." It's ship. over. It's over. We we've overreached our grasp. Yes, I'm going to have a heart attack. We're Those type of moments, like when Hayden is driving around at 4 a.m. I want I want more 4 a.m. Hayden, actually, around. I I would probably say the most the the thing that Jim Ward really gravitated toward, uh, aside from just like the being unleashed with the Force and you're this powerful user. The pulling down of the Star Destroyer. <laughs> oh my God! So, but that was, but that was a, that was an early concept piece, and that, and Jim Ward really hung his hat. He's like, that's what I want to see, and I think in a lot of ways, that concept piece sold it to George, mm -hmm. you know, and even before George to to um, Jim Ward, and and that was the thing where, and and Adam Piper, man, God bless his soul. Hmm. He worked on that thing, and and he had he had the Herculean task of like trying to bring that into the game, which he did. And you know, it's 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 one of those moments that I think you know people who play the game like obviously that 
Hold on, let's, let's hold we for didn't one second. Hold on, let's pause for one like, second, Brett. That was like Brett, the Brett. End, like, that was close to the end of production when we got Here, that thing. Hey, Brett, press, press, pause your story pause for a second. Because yep. they won't be able to hear you over the cuts. Angry, but hold on. I think he wants to be able to yell at you in person. Hurry. Hurry. Shakti's apprentice has gone mad. This whole planet has gone insane. Oh, we're not crazy. <laughs> We've just embraced the power of the dark side. Stand aside, girl. Don't make me hurt you. <laughs> you won't. He won't Genius let myths. you. Nice. All right, okay, we're right, back. So continue. Continue. So, so I, I think, I think um, that scene alone, because it was such. It was such a big thing, and it, it it was really what 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 the foundation of this game was about was such a powerful force user that he could rip a star destroyer out of the sky and cause it to crash, and that was one of the last things that we got that we got working, and and you know we're just like we had it's like we had to get that in. If we don't get this in, then we're not hitting on the things that we originally kind of in a way sold the game to the executives on was this all all you know all port powerful force user so you, you know that, that was down on the wire <laughs> get yeah. that thing in wow yeah i remember we were we were given an additional was it four months brett what was the we were given uh an extension which by the way saved my butt and the sound team's butt but there were other issues going on yeah. with the game but we were no I, well it's funny because at first it's like oh wait and then it's like no we're back in 07 and then it went back to 08. <laughs> wow, really? Was it was it going back and forth? And I think in the, in, the, in the meeting where they said it's coming out in 07, uh, it was a company meeting, and Hayden's like, uh, okay, so this is news to me. Uh, can we get back to work then? I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but, but Hayden I think it just... I through to that point, right? Good golly, like, you know, can can we get out of this three-hour meeting and oh go my God, back so and make this game? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. oh sh shout outs to Mariana, uh, Mariana for this uh, this level. Mike Kawas did an amazing job getting all this this level to look like just like the concept piece that uh, that Amy Beth created. Uh, we also have uh, Craig Matchett that worked on Mare's Brood, and Yoon that worked on this amazing white uh, rancor. Yeah, Mr. Yoon, Kim, cool. Master Yoon, as we call them, amazing character artist. Impressed with how well I'm handling this thing. I'm very impressed. I Great mean, job. I it's. Wow. Okay, watch, and now I die. Maybe, maybe not Maris, though. We've been challenged to do Force Lineage 3, apparently, in the chat. Yes, oh, okay. well, they, that comes, up, that comes yeah. up quite a bit. Yeah, well, I actually, we've been working on it um, <laughs> three weeks on the side. We have a team of two. Right now, it kind of looks like Solitaire, <laughs> but I mean, I think <laughs> if we give it a little more time, it might look like Solitaire. Like Battle Chess. Battle well, chess. You guys laugh about it, but I, I, I don't know, like, if you, that last image that I added on your, uh, on your Dropbox, Sam. Oh. Um, I'm still kind of, you know, I still have my hands on Force Lineage at least a little bit, man. I'm, I'm working on a, a new render, a new sculpt of, of Starkiller that I want to, uh, I'm working with uh, Acme Archives, and we want to make it into a, a print, into a canvas print that they'll eventually sell. Um, Amazing. By the way, Manny, do you have the ability to do the lottery thing? Do you, t can you do it on your own app? I would have to bring in a bot, and we will have to get it set up for uh, another stream. Is there a way to do it for this stream? We can randomly scroll through and pick somebody, but we don't have the bot in here at the moment. We don't have the bot. Yeah. The bot. Huh. Well, I wonder if we could do a thing where we go, first one to answer this tri trivia question or something like that. Is that possible, do you think? Yeah, that could work. What if we get multiple answers that are... Oh, first one. Right. First, first one, first one on the chat. I, I, do you want to... Should we do this? Should we... Here, let's, let's yeah, do yeah, one. Yeah. We'll That'd do one yeah. giveaway. This. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so everyone, we are giving away for people who join in live on these stream because... It was interesting because this 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 little de uh, dev thing is um, it sticks around on my Twitch for a week, and then we pass it off to the com link, and it's getting mm -hmm. some really good viewership and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But for the live viewers, we thought, on YouTube, com we wanted, on YouTube, we wanted to uh, set you guys up with some cool stuff for tuning in live. So Manny was kind enough. Let me just switch so I can see what I'm showing them. Manny was kind enough to provide prints. Signed by Manny Lamas, that are uh, that the sun not is the artist up. TS Prince TS not Prince. Uh, sign of the times. Yeah, we we had a Prince album for yeah, you. Not, not Prince the performer. Yeah. Here, David, take, take yes. the first Prince. Formerly known as Prince. Yes. So we have these 
Prince, formerly known as Manny. Yeah. And we're going to be giving these away per episode. Now this, Manny, can you talk about your work with Acme and Sydney? You've become a licensed artist, a Star Wars artist, this Boba Fett. We got this Boba Fett on the screen right now. Oh, nice. Uh, this yeah. is a great print. You had this at Comic-Con, didn't you? Uh, yeah, so uh, um, actually, I remember talking to Acme a few years ago and be like, you know, I'd like to work with you guys, you know, put some some uh, fine art printouts uh, for you guys to sell. Uh, you know, I, I, anytime I can get my hands on working on Star Wars, I'm, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, um, you know, after Lucas was sold to Disney, um, you know, uh, t so many of us were just hardcore, like, Star Wars artists and, you know, contributors to the universe. We loved, you know, that, that aspect of it, let alone everything else. I really was second to, to, to it, you know, but at least for me, I speak for myself. I mean, I, I just love being able to add to that universe. So att keeping in touch with that stuff is super important to me. So um, on my spare time, even after working the crazy amounts of hours that we worked for, uh, uh, for Force Unleashed and the, the sequels and the gold editions and whatever, um, I would still spend some time at home or at the studio even and do some extra pr uh, renders and things for the team or things that could be used to uh, market, you know, the market team could use for when the game was going to launch or the, afterwards, you know, or stand-ups, magazine covers, anything like that. So uh, one of the things that I did was I started that Boba Fett uh, render and uh, beauty illustration. That's and awesome. I kind of reworked it, you know, uh, throughout the years, every now and then I would pick it up and fix up the colors or, you know, bring it up to a higher state where I think it should be. Because you know, as an artist, you never, never ever think that you're finished with a piece. You could always do something else to fix it. So Boba Fett is one of the best examples of that stuff for me. I've always been working in it forever until I stopped when I, I submitted it to, to Acme on that, his final form of, of a more of a realistic photo, photo shoot, more monochromatic. And uh, they loved it, and it's, it's being sold there right now. And it's yeah, they keep sending me tubes to, to to sign up for them. I have two right now that they keep bugging me to send them back. But uh, it's it's gotten received really really well, man. I'm really happy that I was able to do that. Congratulations. And we're actually gonna be sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so what, congratulations. Yeah. What we're gonna do is we're going to ask um, a trivia question, and the first person to answer correctly on the chat, we will uh, we will send you uh, a print. We'll send you prints. We'll or the send artist you, formerly known as... We'll send you a jar of purple rain. <laughs> yeah. Purple rain. Should uh, we actually yes. do the first one and now? some crying doves. Do yes, we'll, let's do yeah, it. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do two of them right now. So... Oh, wow. Uh, let, me, let me think of... Okay, hold on for a second. And the circular ones are co-signed by Mr. Sam Whitmer as well. So That's right. Get a or they where, will uh, be. They will be signed. I haven't signed them yet. Still? So, really? we, <laughs> so what do you think? You want to give away that one and the Boba Fett one today, David? Sure. And then the next one, the next two will be... Yes. Okay, so... Everyone, is everyone set? Is everyone ready? So for this one... Are we frozen? Uh, yeah. No, no, no. It's, I'm just putting it... It takes a second for it to... Refresh. Got it, got it, got it. So we are now going for this, signed by Manny Lamas. Lamas. Um, for this fine piece, we're going Jamas. to ask a trivia question. In Espanol. What? what? Oh, Llamas? Just Llamas. In, Llamas. In, in, in Spanish. Yeah, in Spanish. Yeah. Why is it that I've never known this? How come I, all of my friends, I don't know how to pronounce their last name? I'm like, because Matt Omernick. Because the person that I meet, and I, I say Jamas, and they look at my name written, they're like, huh? And then I have to explain it. And I was like, you know what? Just <laughs> We'll just go with Llamas for a bit. Yeah. Okay, so this one. We're giving away this one. Is everyone standing by? You guys ready? Oh, the, start, the Vader in the back? Because I have the question, and this is, this is going to be for five, loyal, loyal podcast yes. listeners. And, and Brett, no, you may not answer. Damn it. Um, Okay. Can I what, enter? Can we win? This? What was... No, Manny. You can print your own. What was the original, the first name that did not later on go on to be the official name? What was the first original name of Starkiller? Oh, that's a tough one. What was his name? His real name? Do you need to fault the first and last or nah, just the first name? Pink Ninja got it. Oh, oh so she's, she's not getting the, the print. <laughs> yeah. Jacob. Dude, that's my, that's my girlfriend, man. Uh, oh, is she? Wait, is that wait, your wait, girlfriend? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> she just wrote, "Damn it." Uh, okay, okay. Well, so we got to do a different one. Right? Well, no, no, no. Cho then, no, no, then chosen, the next, next guy that, that chosen writer five one three got but it. Couldn't he there see you pink go. ninjas? No, no, no. They would have typed it out. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So chosen writer five one three. Hey, you got it. Chosen writer five one three. Okay. So what I want you to do is, if you can uh, direct message me, I'm going to write down your name, give me your address, <laughs> and we'll send that off to you. And then later on in the podcast, we'll go for the Bubba Fat one. Yes. So. Beautiful. Congrats, man. Congratulations. <laughs> the and and Sam like is going to sign it, right? <laughs> so wait, yeah, still sign it. I'm yeah. going to sign it. I'm going to write down the chosen writer 513 so I don't forget. I want to hit you well, up for one and, of those proxy and, prints. And just to kind of jump in on like the official canon name of Galen Merrick, 
Mm-hmm. That was actually decided upon by licensing, and Hayden was very much against giving him a name, yeah. like a formal name, mm-hmm. and uh, and we actually won to get it removed, but somehow it still remained in the German novelization, and that's how it stuck, because they didn't pull the name <laughs> from the book, wow. from the novelization, and that's why we have Galen Merrick. Awesome. I remember when that got sent out to the teams, like, here's the name of the apprentice, and everybody just like look at each other like, huh? It's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that was a surprise to me too. Like Galen Merrick, weird. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Um Okay. So I've got your name down here, and then later on we will do the Boba Fett giveaway. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, this is all this is all an argument to uh to uh get your internet completely uh decked out. The next time we do this, by the way, it's gonna be complete random drawing. Unless, of course, the, the trivia thing is just way too cool. I don't know. What do you guys think? Random drawing or trivia? Well, we can do trivia. I like the trivia. Trivia is kind of neat. It, it makes you... Maybe you it, can switch back and forth for some of the people that are super hardcore fans that might know all the inside stuff. They we'll can do, still get a chance to win. Yeah, one random, one trivia. There you go. That'd be cool. Hey. You know, that was one thing. Is uh, I think it's in Force Unleashed 2. You guys did a mall killer, like a... A cross between Darth <laughs> yeah. Maul and Star Killer, yeah. Which, which not long Mark after that was DLC very content. Yeah. Like, oh God, not again! No, don't do it! Don't um, make us do it! Not long after that, I was. It, it seemed entirely appropriate because I was like playing Darth Maul. Like I remember, there was a fan. Foreshadowing. Um, yeah, there was a fan at a con that did a painting of Star Killer versus Darth Maul, and I'd already recorded Darth Maul, but I but no one knew yet. So I remember thinking, like, ah, oh, this fan's going to be pleasantly surprised. Um, Oy. No! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it, Maris! Oh, no, damn it! Your drink card is too big! <laughs> hey, so I want more stories of things going horribly yeah, wrong. Yeah, what else went horribly wrong, Manny? So, so Brett spoke about, you know, closer to the end of production and all this. Um, I think for the art team, uh, I can probably s- safely speak for the t- whole team in, in, in this respect. Uh, we, there was so much work to do that we couldn't really think about trying to finish the game or when we were going to finish or when we were going to ship. Like shipping the game was something that we didn't think about, something that, you know, was, I don't know, we, I, I, I don't think anybody was really like, oh, I can't wait for, you know, this date when we can ship the game. It's like, no, man, we, we have this level and we have to spruce up this other thing and I'm trying to get this other thing into the game because this, you know, the, the, the producers and the, engin- the gameplay guys said that it wasn't going to work and I'm going to try anyway, see if we can squeeze that in there. I mean, it was all just like, every, every week was like, oh my God, like, can I get this thing in? Not can we finish this game. So but you there guys... was a point in 08 where we had to be done by May. <laughs> <laughs> the, producer the producer steps in. in and just says, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Manny, we can't keep filter, working on this. And you're, I need your signature here, yeah, here, and here. Yeah, this it, is this is so. But I love that. I love that that just happened because it's it shows that is exactly what the relationships are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what happened. Like the artists are always like, well, yeah, but we can do this, we can do this, and then and then Brett Rector has to come in and say, no, we can't. Yeah, we must ship. Done. This day. Well, there's, there's always ways uh, around, you know, I mean, obviously it's important to, to ship, obviously, right? Like, we, we needed to get this game out, and it was so, so many things we're trying to finish at the same time. But Darth Maul is actually one of those, a really good example of how we're able to really, you know, get the team together to push some stuff in, even though we didn't have the time to do it. And we the still Darth were Maul able fight. to do it some way, somehow. You know, the whole team, the gameplay, uh, the, the, the modeling, the sound, everything, like everything, the cinematics, the fight scenes. Because uh, a lot of things happened with this Darth Maul character that was not supposed to go in, you know, by mid-production. Or, I guess, maybe, yeah, maybe three-fourths of the way in was when we, we were dancing around with Darth Maul. Because, uh, I mean, everybody that played the game knows that, you know, you see Proxy, you know, the, the, the fight scene with Proxy that everybody will remember if they played through the game. Uh, f- uh, when he, he brings out this this nice surprise for Starkiller. And, he you know, the, the music cues in, he turns into, pro- into Darth Maul, the lightsabers go out, you know, like in episode one, and you have this epic fight, you know, and everybody loves love to see Darth Maul come back. So uh, when we were uh, talking about doing uh, that scene and him proxy turning to Darth Maul at some point in the game, we weren't even sure at what point that was going to happen. You know, he was axed before even we got to that point, I think. And they said, you know, we don't have the time, like the, our gameplay guys don't have the time to to, to make this fight scene with with uh, with Darth Maul, you know, we're gonna have to reuse somebody else. 
that comes in and you know reuse some elements from here or there to to do the actual gameplay for that fight scene. And you know, I, I, we, I was down because he's one of my favorite characters in Star Wars, and a lot of people were down because they were excited to see Darth Maul and play as Darth Maul again, right? And the idea is that worth throwing around for the fight scene and the cinematic and the quick time events already at that point, just people were so excited about it. So uh, as we're finishing our work on the character side of things, I mean, well, every every week, every three weeks, every four weeks, I guess for before DLC for the deadlines for each character. Um, I stayed late after doing some some work, and I would work on Darth Maul on like really late into the night as mice were crawling up my leg. And <laughs> eventually, I, I finished the the Darth Maul piece. And you know, every we had, I guess, yeah, we had like our big meetings, you know, once a week, and. Well, I guess we should talk about the meetings later on, but it's I look forward to these meetings like crazy. Like no other studio that I've worked at had this kind of culture or you or look forward to the meetings and see everything that you know the, the way that it was ran by the producers and just listening to uh to Hayden talk about the game and explain things out. I mean, I, I look forward to those meetings and I miss them and it's something that I never experienced in another team before. So huge shout out to, to those guys, man, because you you don't see that kind of stuff in, in most game studios, hands down, man. But anyways, uh, be, uh before one of the meetings, you know, you the character all the artists were uh, able to give screenshots of some of their work to uh to Brad or to uh, other producers to put into the meetings. Uh, so in one of those meetings, uh, as I finished the Darth Maul model, I, I snuck in a render that I made for Darth Maul. And I was like, here you go, Brett, here's the work that I finished, you know, the last week or so. So, you know, they're scrolling through the artwork for the artist, and every now and then you go up with a microphone and talk about it. But the Darth Maul piece came up on the screen, and everybody, like, looked at it, so they looked around, like, I thought we weren't doing Darth Maul, like, I thought we were going to be able to create it, you know, first of all. I uh, created the model for it, but everybody like saw it finished, you know, it was completed. I was All the other work was done as well uh, um, for my plate and the other character artists. And that kind of like started, you know, the ball. It got it rolling again hey, on the Darth Maul side of things. Won. And people got super Senators excited at that yours. point and they're like, we can do this, let's do it, you know. And the, the, the game designers you found time to do it. You and the sound guys and the, the cinematic guys. Side. And I, mean, I worked with uh, Kento, uh, awesome it's animator in The Force Unleashed. And I helped him choreograph the fight scene for Darth Maul. And then this, the camera guys did an awesome job of framing everything. And it came together and I, we couldn't be more proud that we were able to do that. That's awesome. By the way, we'll, we'll hold on to the cutscenes down. Just let me get away from here. Just let me go. And I'll turn my back on the dark side. That one. She reminds me too much of another young Jedi who turned to the dark side. You shouldn't have let her go free. You really think she's free? She'll carry the memories of what she's done here. Oh, oops. Oh, what? you hit the button. Did you just, just say it? the word forever? Just say the word. You ready? Shh, 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 shh. Forever. Okay, cut, <laughs> cut, cut. Can you give us three more of those? Give me three variations of that, please. <laughs> Brett, please speak. Someone just asked what Brett, happened to Brett, 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 we're, Brett, we're, Brett, we're, we're and, recording. And we're take, recording. Take 37. Thank you, Brett. 38, please, I should say. Please, this is really hard. Come on. Come give, on. Us, give me three variations. I need to concentrate. Actually, come on, come on. Little, hey, no, uh, every, please, you know what? You want, you want to trash your lights? This you want exactly, to trash your lights? This is what it was like. Why are you exactly trashing my like. scene? Yes, We're rolling. Why are you yes, trashing my scene? We're rolling. <laughs> Say forever, I three in a row, forever. That says me and Christian Bale are done professionally. You know what, Manny? Brett, we're done professionally. The game came out in 2008. Nice guy, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Nice guy. All right, one more time, one more time. Forever. One more time. Three Shut up. Forever, here we go. Forever. Forever. For. Uh, ever. Forties version. Forever. Uh, forever. forever? Uh, Cockney. Forever. Forever. That's it. That's it. Put we that got in the game. It. And that's actually it. what's in there. And get through the flavor in there. One of, one of the things that we did about for recording this game is, you know, games up to that point were all recorded, you know, using. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. Oh, oh, another oh, cutscene. Go. Oh, good, good, good. Dangerous Shut up. I know I owe you my life. But <laughs> here we go. You don't owe me anything. I told you on Cloud City that I can't help you. Not since I lost my sight. He's your hero, and it's his rebellion. Join us because he's asking you to. <laughs> Master Adam. You are the first to really fight the Empire. We're not prepared to go to war yet. We need weapons and starships and people with the courage to use them. 
I don't know how many others will stand with, with my us. my eyes ripped out, I can't even but see how am I supposed to fight. <laughs> well, yes, there are other senators who have spoken out against the Emperor. But they will be hard to convince. Jimmy Smiths. We just need to show them that the Empire is vulnerable. Let me meditate on that. <laughs> we got to talk about Easter eggs for some of the costumes. The right target. There's a great moment here In the coming meantime, up for Senator, proxy. Gather your friends. Sure we like. need all the help we can get. Master, he's here. You have received my message? Yes. Your mission goes well. I have recruited others. Well, to Master, I've cost, come to kill you again. Now I need your counsel. My allies seek a major Jump. strike against the Empire. Jump. The Emperor rules the galaxy through fear. Jump. You must destroy a symbol of that fear. <laughs> The Empire is building Star Destroyers above Raxus Prime. That shipyard is your next target. Thank you. And the cloth oh, in this you. game. Sam, you've got poop on your face. Again. Your this always happens every time you go to Felucia. Oh, uh, yeah, that was that was me. I, I put all the dirt on you. I hate being here. And actually, the cosplayers actually replicate that stuff too. I don't know if you guys have. You just you just talked about the cool moment, Aunt Manny. Oh, God damn it. You're fired. Yeah, he says, "I, I, hate, being I hate being him. I hate being him." And he goes, "Yeah, I think he does too." We'll talk, like we'll talk about it in a second. Okay. Do you know this isn't what it looks like? Of course it is. You're still loyal to Vader. After he branded me a traitor and tried to. Do you kill know you're you, not supposed to see me like you're this? Still his, his. His. His bitch. Then why did you defy Vader to rescue me? I needed someone to fly the ship! We both know You're that's not true. My being here has never been about my piloting. Sometime soon, you will decide the fate of the Rebellion, not your master. And when you're faced with that moment, just remember that I too was forced to leave behind everything I've ever known. <laughs> Please. All right, Juka the Viking. Don't what is wrong with her face? I will get to that. I will get that in the moment. So we got a few things to talk about here. Do you want to start? Oh well, yeah, I do. I, we, we don't know where so, the cutscene is. It's just ending. Yeah. Okay. The cutscene is over now. So basically, one thing I wanted to bring up, which I think is cool about, yeah, I mean, you know, when we finally get Hayden on here, we'll be able to really go into the story and. and cut into that but like for now we'll continue to lie soon. for right now we will continue to tell our, our half truths and our lies but one of the things that <laughs> that we worked on is like with star killer not only he was very different uh depending on you know like where he was you know who he was talking to for example we talked about how <clears throat> accents when he's right when he's talking to darth vader he's standing on ceremony so he sounds like the perfect sith apprentice you know what is thy bidding my master it isn't my master it's my master you, you <laughs> neutralize the r's and you make it sound a little bit more classical but when he's talking to juno and proxy he's like hey guys what's going on it's you know here we are flying around in a spaceship and so you know and it's the same thing that carrie, carrie fisher did in the original star wars is that you know you know governor talk and i expected to find you holding vader's leash and then when she's talking to him you know when you came in you didn't have a plan for getting out you know and so there's there's <laughs> You know, people do that. When you talk to your grandmother, it's a little bit different than when you talk to your best buddy. Um, so we did that. But then another thing that we did was we made sure that every time that Starkiller had a meeting with Vader, that he got a little stronger. That at first he's groveling at Vader's feet going, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. yes, my master. And he's, he's more not, defiant. Yeah. He's, he's, and every now and then there's little moments of defiance, but, but he's still very afraid of him. And that that last scene... You know, he goes, I, I need something. I need a, a, you know, my allies seek a major strike against the Empire. And he goes, okay, it's the shipyards at Raxus Prime. He goes, thank you, Lord Vader. And then he goes, oh, that was way too strong. Yeah, 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 because that's when Vader shuts him down. He goes, whoa, no, you're... Remember who you are. What's Remember who you... Yeah, the, yeah, Vader has a line that shuts him down a little bit. Because the first he goes, time he doesn't say master, he says, thank you. And, he, and you pause, Lord Vader. And then Vader just... I remember cutting in a breath of a... You know, like yeah, so Vader is like, like, whoa, who are you looking me in the eye and calling me Lord Vader? Yeah. Like, that was a little bit too confident. Yeah. And so, you know, Starkiller is getting to a point where he's growing beyond the scared apprentice and, and becoming something. And Vader does not quite want that. 
Right. And and that's when you can see Starkiller kind of averts his eyes. And th these are all things that we designed out when we were, you know, when we were doing this. And the thing that made that possible was that Hayden Blackman's script was so evocative and so well drawn. So we we kind of knew the trajectory of how this character was going to grow. Um, so yeah, but you were, you were going to say you had some other stories about that. Uh, no, I was I was actually just going to ask Manny. So we had a question about about proxy sort of shrinking and growing and and you know there was a lot of conversation about proxy as a hollow droid need, needing to be able to change form slightly and being able to get taller and you had that great darth maul uh transitional art piece or somebody did on the wall at uh at the presidio oh, but can you the transitional was uh uh but his uh, limbs his limbs was, actually was Evo, yeah and then we did like uh renders and we had to figure out how to make them actually you know be able to scale up the skeleton and through animations and which parts would actually work to scale so i had to i had to build those things out in the model and there's a little screenshot that i added for sam actually that shows uh kind of a, a paint over of the skeleton and the areas that will shrink up and grow and actually right, i just saw that we just saw that. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, for me, it just happened right now. So yeah, there's a lot of the things that I kind of figured out, and uh, as I was building the model, which pieces needed to rotate, uh, so that you could scale up the model. And yeah, it became. I like. I totally forgot about the the whole scaling thing. To be honest, until I saw this image yeah. that I sent uh, Sam earlier today. But yeah, like you know, like that proxy model. I was trying to talk about it earlier too. He, he was way over poly count uh, from the poly count limits that we had set for all the characters for the main for the hero characters for force unleashed and he was even trickier because anytime you do a, um, a robot with a um, like exposed exoskeleton you have to not only model the outside you have to model the inside and the inside parts of the outside shell so it, he was like three times over poly count so I had to find ways to really bring down the poly count and do all the crazy amounts of wires that were modeled for his insides and yeah, he was he was a he was a mind job that guy. Is that a sail barge? No, it's Enterprise. It's the Enterprise <laughs> right there. It's the saucer section of the Enterprise. Yeah, that's that's uh, yeah. You actually, you have to go f up up and fight. Um, what's his name? Soren. Yeah. <laughs> This is this is where Shatner dies. Right yeah, but, yeah. Is this the plan where Shatner? You have to fight Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> okay, can we can we just for sci-fi fans out there, let's just take a a little detour to Star Trek Generations, <laughs> which when you break down the story, it's about Captain Picard has to go to the Nexus to find Captain Kirk. So he goes, Captain Kirk, I need your help to go beat up an old guy. I tried to beat him up myself. I couldn't. I, he like was a really he's a pretty good fighter. But with your help, I know we can beat him up. That's right. That's basically it. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Oh, by the way, I know that you're in paradise dead, but if you could just come be dead dead, um, that would be great. Yeah. You'd die like a punk. Die like a punk. Anyway. Well, and, and Shatner and, and Kirk basically, you know, taught, taught Starkiller the move of the karate chop to the neck. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the email from Hayden's going to be so long. Every time. Yeah. You don't need a lightsaber. You don't need Spock's grip. No. Just, you just need karate chop to the neck. Yeah. That's right. Hayden is going to write an email saying <laughs> that <laughs> Shatner is not in Force Unleashed, nor is he in Star Wars, even though he wore a Stormtrooper. Well, he's actually the, the eighth Stormtrooper you kill in Force Unleashed. That's Shatner. He was on the list for DLC characters, but we ran out of time. God, how great would that be? Oh, man. And we also ran out of permission. Licensing nightmare for the producers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, someone wants you to talk about this particular talk about costume. This costume. So, yeah, I mean, this and many costumes. We did like, a, we, we, it's... A, the design that we went through for, with concept artists that were just phenomenal in this in this game, uh, they always thought about like little little shout backs to previous characters or little pieces that maybe Star Killer picked up from other characters. If you guys see uh, uh, the Ultimate Evil version of Star Killer, which is I think probably the fan favorite, I want to say, um, a lot of his pieces came from uh, Bausch. The bounty hunter that Princess Leia disguised as when she goes to save uh, Han Solo. Mm. So if you see like yeah. the shoulder pieces, even the Star Killer. Well, yeah, Star Killer is a little bit, but more on the, on the Ultimate Evil uh, uh, costume when you do the evil ending. Um, he, you, you can see the shoulder pads. His mouthpieces are kind of like sections of the mask, and we we kind of brought a lot of those pieces back in, and get really familiar. Like he actually maybe picked those out. You know, even some pieces on the Tie Fighter costume, the very first costume that you get. You see uh, restraining bolts. You know, all these little things that go in there. On the on the Felucia costume, you see Darth Maul's binoculars on his back. Oh, neat. That he maybe he got somehow. You know, the well, maybe Vader passed on or he gets he picked more up along the way. And, Star Killer gets more well equipped as the as the game goes on. Because earlier on, all of this his piece together now he's actually got some equipment which is another yeah. piece of growth for the character by the way i want to point out i've never found this holocron before this is a first for me 
I think this is the first holocron you found this whole uh, playthrough. Uh, you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> you're a bad person. But but ab about this costume, this was a little bit of a shout out towards uh, more of a Vader build. So yeah. we're trying to He's combine very, a little like, bit of the rebel side. Like this, the point in the game where he starts to turn, like you guys were saying. So the, you you can see like some of the rebel items coming out, like the the X-wing fighter pilot vest on him, and you start seeing that little machine with tubes going in onto his chest, which is Vader, a very uh, Vader esque. Manny, and obviously his mouthpiece. It's the bottom section of uh, Vader's mask. Manny, Hip Optimus Prime said you should have given him a Nintendo Power Glove. <laughs> he found one, and he's it, wearing it. It was hidden be below the wraps. Uh, yeah. Got it. Got it. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. Yeah, that's right. Well, and, you know, I, th I think his, his upgraded attire through the game gives him more confidence <laughs> to, to talk to Vader. Mm -hmm. Because before, he's just he's the lackey. You know, he's got a busted lightsaber. He's he's got he's got janky accoutrement like he, he he's he's like a patchwork quilt, mm -hmm. you know, for like eighteen years of his life, and then he gets to go out. He's got a hot chick. He's got this cool ride. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's dating the prom queen. Yeah. Uh, here's one. When Proxy isn't planning to kill Star Killer, he's making these outfits on Imperial Project Runway. Yeah. <laughs> he. he He's just holograms. He's, 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 he's at the loom, and he's just like you know, throwing together some threads. You know, it, it, it's it's a very much hip hop lifestyle that Starkiller <laughs> leaves. <laughs> right. Other little things we added on the uh, costumes. Uh, the first costume that you get, his little console actually has a, a graphic that we uh, I spend a little extra time on. We put on there uh, Order sixty seven in Arabesh, which is a Star Wars uh, font language. On, on this one, on this on the, on the first one Tie that fighter. you get on oh, the very right. first. Uh, Tie fighter outfit. And what is Order sixty seven? Well, it's the it's the <laughs> hey, you did a good job on Order sixty six. Yeah, Go take ease. the day off. Yeah, exactly. It's hamburger Sunday. fries and a milkshake. Yeah. Well, Order, Order sixty seven. <laughs> Order sixty seven. Uh, it's continuing with Order sixty six from the. And Emperor you can only get that at Mel's Drive In. That's right. <laughs> Which is a place where we went often when we were working on this game. We go. It's to actually Mel's. a pit, uh, pizza pockets. Pizza pockets. Hot pockets. Yeah. Um. God, I love all these spaceships. You see, there's the Rebel transport crashed down right there, and. You guys can't see this, but we can, and, and so can our audience, and that's all that. <gasps> Look what I did. Oh, my friend. The, the TIE pilot's got to be, like, really just bumming hard. Yeah. Like, what's yeah. going on? Yeah. Mm. Just leave you right there. Yeah, I'll leave it. No! So good. Oh, you you are strong with the Force, Sam. Dude, I'm very strong with the Force, man. Or I've played and, this game too much. And One just don't other. drop it. Yeah. Oh, uh, bonk. Yeah, this. G hey! No, no! Actually, it's funny. I've seen Sam play the game and some other shows, and the, the person's try trying to play the game, and he's doing god awful. And Sam will be like, you know, it be really kind and be like, oh, do you want me to, like, you know, get through this part and, you know, like, pretty And then Sam does it, like, you know, without any sweat or anything. He does it in one shot. Well, he got, he got really, really good at this game. Look, man, I'm really good at stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very modest. Go there, on. There we see a, a Corellian YT-1300, like the Millennium Falcon, right there. Um, missing its radar dish. Missing its Which radar West dish. Which out fully for the DLC level as well, for uh, Tatooine. That's right. Oh, that's right, that's correct. And then we threw Obi-Wan into the <laughs> into the thrusters. You, you, yeah, you, you really... One of the things a, a friend of ours named Patrick Callahan, when, when he saw the Obi-Wan fight... <laughs> After Obi Wan was killed, he Brutal. just goes. He just went like, "Man, no respect." Yeah. <laughs> Alec Guinness, for God's sake. I know. No I know. respect. I wasn't crazy about it either, but it's you know it's the ultimate evil. You know. Ultimate, ultimate jerk, really. Like. Yeah, yeah. When we get to the DLC, the DLC was just like no holds barred punishing. I'm an awful human being. And yeah. It was. We killed Chewie for Christ's sake, and we didn't even use a moon. Oh, yeah, we God. didn't even use a moon. We didn't have anything to do with uh, Vector <laughs> yeah. Prime. Yeah, I know. Well, so. Oh, dude, why why would we think of this? Why did Star Killer pull down a moon and drop it on Chewie? Uh, because Adam Piper That's probably no would have. That's no moon. Oh wait, it, it, it is a moon. That, that yeah, is it's falling on me. Killed Chewie. Adam Piper probably would have said, "Absolutely no way." I, you know, that's impossible. Um, and probably would have done it, and it would have been amazing. Right. Um. But uh, you know, but yeah, the, I mean, the, it was to cross franchises. Adam Piper was Scotty on our team. I need more time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's done. He was one of our level designers for the people that are wondering who the hell are they talking about. Do we have? Uh... Oh, thank you for the for the Battlefront uh, 
compliments. I, I hope it sounds good. We we did some of it really fast, so I. Uh, maybe what did you do? Him, he is the emperor. I'm the emperor in Battlefront. Um, yeah. I, I hope it sounds yes. all right. We we did some of it fast, and so maybe it's not my best. But why am I even saying that? That's stupid. It's actually I can tell you firsthand. It's it was very you, no, it's very good. Okay. Well, you, well, David directed me in some of it. In some of it, I you, did. But you directed mm -hmm. me in the stuff that we didn't do too fast. For this new Battlefront, yeah. So um, I'm sure... You directed me in the stuff that is fast and bad. <laughs> yeah. So, the stuff that so, was... <laughs> so David never used the words faster, more intense when you're in the studio? <laughs> Not with the Emperor, no. Not with the... No, like no, that, you, but no. faster, more intense, Sam. Screw you. I'll go as fast as I yeah. want. The <laughs> um, yeah. I suppose now I could share that. So, share, has, share things, David. Nope. Share. Sorry. What were you going to share? Somebody, uh, if you, somebody else asked uh, me earlier about uh, any advice for any uh, artists going to school and getting into the game industry. And uh, that's a, a question that we actually get quite often. Uh, there's the, the, the growth in schooling for video games has uh, grown uh, well from zero, really. There was none when I was, getting, when, uh, when I was trying to get into the industry. There's zero education for any of this stuff. And now it's actually oversaturated to the point where you actually need to really look for the right teachers in schools instead of looking at schools and prices and all this stuff which it makes it really really tricky I mean you, you, you'll you be watching a, yeah, any TV show and you'll see you want to make video games for our living oh man we, we got you you know the, like, all this exciting like <laughs> trying to sell you hot pockets or something but it's you really need to do your research and not fall for all that stuff if you're trying to get into the games and actually you're gonna have to be really dedicated if you really want to make games because making games like this guy's been saying in the past broadcast it's really freaking hard you know, so uh, if you're gonna get into school, uh, look at the art pieces, look at the history that the teachers have, the people that are gonna be teaching you, and forget everything else that they try to show you. Uh -huh. Besides that, and if, if you're, you're like Manny, just make a badass uh, Darth Maul model <laughs> in your spare your time. When I you come in to <laughs> interview, and you know, you'll probably get the job. Oh, well, that's right. right. I actually had a Darth Maul model that I did before. Yeah, and it went, and it went, that's on, right. It was on the wall, dude. It was, yeah, it was, it's it was, still it was on the wall, I think. Great. Yeah, anyway, it's part of the uh, the artwork that we adorn the hallways with. Um, that was that was good times, actually. To see, just in in the Lucas Arts floor and A four that we were at, it, it was always nice to see, and and, and throughout uh, in in the uh, B building or C building as well, just to see like it. We didn't have like George has a has has an has an incredible poster collection which which is featured throughout all of the Presidio. Yeah, he has the like the largest post movie poster collection in the world and they're really incredible. Yeah. And the fact Huge that, posters. that, that like, we had like so many seven great feet pieces posters. from our artists on the wall is it, just a testament to the games that we were making and to the talent that we had within that studio. You know, I, I mean, never thought about that because when you go to the Presidio and you go to Big Rock Ranch and you go to Skywalker Ranch, um, you, you see yeah, you see all this classic movie poster art from from anywhere from like the 20s to earlier to later to the 40s and then every now and then you see a piece of art from something that perhaps we worked on or it's a piece of art that Manny did or something like that and I'm what I'm forgetting is the fact that George is the one who personally chooses the pieces that go on the wall yeah you know like I mean I remember hearing Dara O'Farrell say yeah there was a I walked into a building and there was a guy who was hammering on a on a wall and moving a piece of art and doing this stuff and then i look closer and it was george lucas <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was not happy you know with exactly how the art was hung and so he was doing it himself um he took a very active interest in the architecture of those uh buildings. oh yeah he, he was uh, I, I remember walking through there when they were when they were still in 2005 when i was still at the insider and I'm walking through with my editor on the Lucasfilm side, and you know the 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 the, the painting of George Costanza where he's like, kind of on the sofa. <laughs> oh yeah. And he's Posting. like, <clears throat> and, 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 and I swear to God, George was on the ground in a similar pose, like oh, yeah. looking at three pieces of art. Like, no, where am I going like to hang that. this? And he <laughs> looks up and he sees this this woman I'm with, Linda Kelly, and he's like, "Hi, Linda." And he looks at me, he's like, "Hi," and then he goes back to looking at his artwork. <laughs> Wow. There, there are countless stories of George Lucas um, basically fixing a lot of things. Like he, his his obsession with detail was was very impressive. Legendary. I, I, people yeah. talked about. I remember one of the stories I heard was that, you know there's this old movie theater in San Rafael off of uh, Smith Ranch Road, and there was some uh, stand up you know display for 
I don't know if it was one of the Star Wars movies or it might have even been Red Tails. I don't even know what it was. But someone said they spotted George in the lobby and he didn't like where they had placed it. He's like, well, this doesn't make any sense, you know. And then he moved it from one place over to another place, moved it around, looked back, looked at it, moved it again, you know, moved it around. And said, well, there, that's how it's supposed to work, you know. He would just go into places and, you know, he'd go into the lobby of Big Rock Ranch and if someone had moved a chair... He would stop what he was doing, go over to the chair, look at it, and move it back so that it was directly proportional and, like, really well aligned and made a good uh, portrait, you know, as you walked into the front doors. And, like, you heard those stories all the time about George. You know, he's a frustrated architect. Well, not really a frustrated architect because he built a lot of buildings that were all gorgeous. And even with Skywalker Ranch, there's a – he had – you could read about this in certain magazines that have covered Skywalker Ranch throughout the years. But there's a fake history that he developed in his mind of how – from sort of like an anthropological way, this this group of buildings would coexist with each other. That that the main house would have started as sort of like a, you know, uh, a sort of 19th century era main house, you know, overlooking farmland or vineyards. And eventually the winery would have showed up later in the 1920s or the 30s. Mm-hmm. And that's where they would have been making the wine. And the winery building, of course, being Skywalker Ranch. So, like, there's this whole way that he puts together buildings and he, th- he really thinks about that stuff. And it's very impressive. You know, this uh, actually makes a lot of sense now. Every time we came in the morning, I remember like a lot of artists had like their action figures and the collectible statues on their desk. I mean, it's a development studio, so everybody has their desk, just like almost like Brett's desk at home. Uh, and every time people would come in the morning, their figures were posed in very sexual positions. <laughs> uh, no, that was Brett. Actually. Yeah, it was Brett. Oh, was that, that was Brett? Was yeah, that was hey, Brett's man. contribution. Yeah, that yeah. was actually Jet. But that was nobody Jet actually Lucas. Jet Lucas. went around and <laughs> moving everybody's statues into these poses. That's hilarious. Actually, so, I mean, as many as expressed, my, my love of collecting is without measure. Yes. Um, and well, one of the coolest figures that I was ever given, and having mentioned Jet, uh, back when he was like 13 or 12, he, w- he was a, a, an intern on the game. On the Force of Nature, yeah. Yeah, he, he was an intern, and, and basically, what it, you know, and he sat in meetings and and you know we wanted to give him kind of the because he wanted me to be a game maker at that point um and it was kind of on me to kind of look after him and make sure that he didn't disturb too many people like carl wattenberg and get him <laughs> sidetracked this chris story. tucker chris tucker by the way <laughs> sorry oh exactly. you're doing the chris tucker with the storm but, but one of the, the coolest things well so he would come to my desk and i'd have figures there and he would start behead beheading all the figures because oh, the hasbro stuff you could pop the heads off so I'd come in in the morning and I'd see all these like decapitated figures, and, but but then one day uh, he comes in, he's he's just like, I don't I don't see my action figure because there was the George Lucas family set that had right. two sisters. Well, he also dead. had the stormtrooper though, remember? What's that? He also had the stormtrooper George Lucas. Oh yeah, no, but I'm just saying like there, there was like that yeah, yeah, yeah. from the movie, you know, as a it, it was as Mana and Katie and Jet and George in the set. Right. And he came in one day, one morning, and he, and, and he handed me, he's like, here. And he, Jet gave me his action figure of himself. <laughs> nice. <laughs> as, 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 um, from uh, Revenge of the Sith. And, like, that's one of my, you know, it's just, it's one of those things. It's like, wow. Like, I was actually given an action figure by the person who was, I, I don't know, it was you know, he's just a little thirteen-year-old kid, but it was. Uh, well, yeah, for people, was cool. It's it's one of my it's really one cool, of my man. favorite little things. For people that don't know, uh, Jet Lucas, George's son, played the Jedi um, when Jimmy Smith. And we got to talk about Jimmy Smith. Yeah. Uh, Zet Jukasa. Yeah, Zet Jukasa. When when Jimmy Smith comes into the Jedi Temple and this young Jedi is trying to escape, and the clone troopers gun him down in Episode Three, that's actually Jet. That's George's son. Yeah. Who plays that role? Um, but yeah, speaking of Jimmy Smith, so someone asked uh, earlier in the chat room, that is actually Jimmy Smith in yes. The Force Unleashed. So uh, Dara O'Farrell, my boss, reached out to his agent and uh, Jimmy Smith said yes. And we were all like, oh my God, that's amazing. And so he was flown up from Los Angeles for the day and he shot, he did a head scan in the morning and uh, we shot, and, f- and we actually flew you up, Sam, as well to, to, uh, to read across him. from him. Yeah. So I remember it was you and me and Jimmy Smith's. Uh, reading across from him because I was reading as Leia or Vader or whatever and I remember interrupting him at one point right before he was supposed to say a line or something and I'm feeling like just awful like oh my god I just interrupted Jimmy Smith's like I got the line (laughs) wrong or something but he was so gracious he was was, great 
he was so I can't tell you how how great it is to meet someone who, with that much experience have him come in and work on your game and have him be that cool he was really really incredible and then you know because the PlayStation 2 and Wii version were different once we finished shooting everything he had to strip off the little dots off his face and then reread the entire script again um, because it was different uh, for the PlayStation 2 and Wii versions. It was a very long day for Jimmy Smith, but he did a great job. He was great. He was a lot of fun to work with. He was super collaborative and, and, and easy and fun. And I think one of my favorite little moments was I felt particularly insecure when, when it was time to do... Because we were reading all the characters with him. Yeah. And so it was time to... The part where he's captured and, and, and Palpatine is telling him off. And, you know, and it's occurred to me, like, you know, he is, is the guy, the last time he did this, he was working with Ian McDermott. So I'm like, uh, you know, <laughs> and I, I'm not really feeling that confident about the Palpatine thing because it was very new to me at the time. So I, so we basically say action and I, you know, and I say that, you are traitors to the Empire, you will be interrogated, tortured, you will give me the names of your friends <laughs> and your allies. Nailed it. And then you will die. Yeah, and, and we, that was one of the oh best. Oh my god, moments. that line, dude! We joked about that inside, like at the inside of the studio, a lot. We just love that take. We love that take because there is this and flipping energy. But, <laughs> but the uh, the what I what I was so happy about was that after I did that, and it was just like the first time I did it, and I'm walking around like an idiot, like I'm basically like in a t-shirt and jeans, and and walking around like this, you know. You're a bad person in my hands. Like, like I'm wearing a robe or something, but I'm like, I'm just such an idiot. And, and I'm, I just feel like an idiot and I'm pacing around. So Jimmy has like an eye line to follow and saying all these things like the emperor and all this stuff. And then afterward, you know, after the take, Jimmy goes, so Sam, are you, are you, uh, are you doing this? Is this for, for the game? Are you doing this? And I said, yeah. He's like, good job. And I'm like, cool. That's all awesome. Right. That's all right. That's awesome. Because he, he actually worked with the guy, you know? And like One moment about that line and your choice to go, and then you will die. There is, will die. There's a flippant energy to the emperor when he gets very confident. Like, you know, this is how I've seen it. He will meet you and blah, blah, blah. When he's explaining he to Vader. To you and then you will be Yeah, it's, he's almost me. bored. Yeah. You know, like he's just like, for God's sake, like he just... You know, and, and that's kind of, I think, why we liked that that read so much and why that was the select mm -hmm. uh, when you did that. And then you will die. Yeah. Like, it was just this very sort of, like, flippant, uh, very, you know, little nuance to pick up on with the Palpatine character that just really helped sell it, as opposed to every line being this, like, over-the-top oh, evil. Yeah. You know, let's let's vary it, vary it up a little bit. And um, one of the things that we did recording this game was, we were, I was starting to say this a little earlier, we recorded it differently. Now it's very commonplace, you know, with the Uncharted game and all that kind of stuff uh, but for us we weren't doing the sort of typical recording with the giant microphones we recording it you know with uh, you know, really like using production sound techniques from film you know like a, yeah. radio mics or shotgun mics like a boom and so sometimes the lines got very 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 quiet yes you know? they did and so this was this I think helped sell sort of the drama of this too is that there were these very very quiet reads that I remember when I was mixing I would just have to just boost the crap out of the, the levels because it was just you know, like, Almost I mean, whispered. you guys were whispering when, when, uh, when she was just like, just let me go in that last scene, just let yeah. me go. And I, I swear I'll walk away from the dark side forever. Like you could barely hear her on the day. You know, I remember checking the take later going, did we get that? Did we get that? You know, and we did fortunately, but you know, it was just a very different read than say doing like a monkey Island or something like that, where you're just kind of reading it, uh, in a very gamey fashion. This was not like that at all. It was a dramatic script and we really tried to keep it that way. Uh, throughout the performances, and Jimmy Smits did the same thing. He came in and did it like that. Yeah, I re read it like a film. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, Mike Sanders on this project. Oh yeah, from um, ILM. Yeah. We, we mentioned him a little bit before, but um, you know, there was there was. It was funny because because the whole ILM thing was a little bit new to people. There were people on the set that didn't understand who Mike and Spencer were. Uh, Mike and Spencer were from from ILM. And they were doing their mocap thing. And they were also, you know, they were leading the technology to bring the likenesses into the game. And um, and creating that technology and using it. And in fact, for, you know, for, again, for years, our, our faces were up in the ILM research basement as study models for, um, you know, for facial mocap and facial capture and, and creating likenesses and stuff like that. And I remember one of, the, one of our crew members, one of our LucasArts crew members, called Mike Sanders all the time, Slate Guy. 
because Mike Sanders was the guy who was like, you know, okay, it's a scene 23, take three. I think he only did it once. Clap. Oh, he called him, okay, but he called him Slate Guy once. And everyone just went, oh, God, Slate Guy. Slate Guy's the smartest guy in the room, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slate Guy he's is... He's the guy that's running everything. He's the most intelligent person in this room, and, and you're calling him Slate Guy. That yeah, yeah. funny to us. Yikes. We, we, we ended up calling... Um, our workflow in there we called it industrial light and spencer, spencer. yeah yeah because spencer so we had this guy this you know spencer was a guy basically running the mocap rig and at that time it's crazy to think about do this you remember now. The, you could only do takes up to 45 no 90 seconds was it 90 seconds it was like 90 and seconds. the computer would crash and the computer like, would crash nowadays it's unheard of you know having you know having been on set for some of the uncharted games and the last of us and stuff like that i mean you know and sam you've done plenty of mocap since then yeah. like you can run and run and run now forever but at the time it was like still so new and we were still learning how to synchronize audio with it i mean you know some other folks had figured it out at sony and other places so it's not like we were the first people to do it but we everyone was <clears throat> still trying to figure it out kind of on their own and the computer would crash after running for 90 seconds so you and had we to knew cut that. Yep. You had to cut or else you were going to lose the take. And if you had a longer scene, you would do the first half of the scene and then you would do the second half of the scene. Swear to God, that's so crazy to think about now. I hadn't Nuts. thought about that in a long time. That is not the way we work these days. No, you just yeah. run and run and run. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, because what it's doing is it's, you know, you've got multiple cameras on, you know, on you. Oh, cutscene. Cut scene. Uh, listen for the Wilhelm scream in this cutscene. Wilhelm scream. Wait, did it get replaced? Oh, it's it's coming up. There it is. That's all Tom Bible. He did all the editorial for that. Tom Bible did all the design. What is Visceral's upcoming Star Wars game? Well, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Oh, well, look, look what I'm doing. This is not right. But I did it. Gonk. Bonk. No! Yeah. Do we still have Manny and uh, Brett yes. on there? Excellent. Yeah, I'm just I'm just captivated by uh, well, the yeah, prowess well, with which you're streaming through like this it. game. Well, it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, I, I should I I could put it on Sith Master and then it wouldn't be nearly as impressive. I get my <laughs> I get my butt kicked. In. Actually, I, I I do know uh, small little things about the visceral game, but I'm no, not ready to say anything. Yeah, do not. Well, then why don't I have a job in it, dude? I do not know, but I will. <laughs> you know, I will certainly bring you up. Please at my bring me next up. meeting. You should bring me up. <laughs> oh dear. I've got a briefcase full of Ritz crackers and I just sit there and we go over Whoa, whoa, stuff. we're not talking about Ritz. What? Our Putting sponsors. Ritz? Our sponsors. Ritz is the sponsor? <laughs> oh, I'm no, sorry. Oh, hot pockets. Pockets. You sponsor? Did we lose? Oh, hot, oh, pockets. hot pockets. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. Okay. No, hot oh, pockets. Is... Oh, gonk in half. Gonk in hell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very cool. Wilhelm scream. So you heard it. Good. Very good. Um, yeah. So we're approaching. Uh, is are we? We're approaching the Darth Maul fight, aren't we? We are. Yeah. Yes. That's what I thought. And you know what? Maybe we should end with the Darth Maul fight, and then we'll talk a little bit more with the, you know, and then we'll, yes. we'll call it after that. Yes. 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 So I was telling a Robot Chicken story earlier. I remember Robot Chicken Star Wars came out, and Seth Green and. Uh, uh, Matt Seinrich. Matt, Matt Seinrich and, and uh, uh, who are some of the guys that do the voices? Oh, uh, oh, dude from Clueless. Yes, the dude from Clueless. Anyway, we, we were, I, I feel so and bad. Yes, dude from Clueless. That's well, like, he, yeah, he was in Road Trip. He, he, played, he played Boba Fett in, uh, in, in Robot Chicken. He, anyway, he's hilarious. And for whatever reason, being, of course, I'm on mic. I forget his name. But he and Seth Green both were like in front of an entire Q and A afterwards, you know, at ILM, was just like, just started going on about how much they loved the Force Unleashed, and uh, you know, I went up to them afterwards and I said, you know, I was I was proxying the game and I, I did all the sound, and I remember him just going, dude, when Darth Maul came out, and you mm -hmm. hear Duel of the Fates, and he turns into Darth Maul, he said he put the controller down and he slow clapped. He was like, bravo, <laughs> that is the he smartest. He told me that same story. Did he? <laughs> well, what's his name? Breckenmeyer. Breckenmeyer. There it is. The guy so from yeah. Red Race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and I just love that. Manny, you, I, you and I might have been standing next and to each other. And thank you for Jupiter Tronic give for give him a few prints getting on the nest faster than us. Oh, we you did? You gave him a few prints. Smart. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, they were talking so much about the game during the meetings, you know, because they got the shows the, the, the shows before they came So out. the prints you gave him, was it Alphabet Street or was it Raspberry Beret? Do you remember which prints you gave him? It was, just, it was just purple, baby. It was just, just purple. purple. Okay. I was just it was checking. It beautiful purple. Ooh, a red one. 
And a blue one. Purple yeah. rain. There you go, Brecken. Here's here's nothing compares to you. Not the Sinead version. But, no, I actually I gave him a version of that Star Killer that uh, we gave away earlier, and I also gave uh, Seth uh, Boba Fett, and they were just ecstatic. And I was geeking out, and they were geeking out, and it was just beautiful. I played, um, me and David it's, it's, did a Star Wars role-playing game night with uh, Seth's wife, Claire. Yes. And we had a lot of fun with that. And Naomi Kyle from And IGN. Naomi Kyle from And IGN. Pablo Hidalgo from and, Lucasfilm. And Pablo Hidalgo, who would sketch out what was happening sketch to Sketch out us. our characters, yeah. God, I, I miss those days. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. That was really fun. Um, very cool. Here, I think you can blow through this wall. Sam is quite the uh, game master, by the way. You run RPG games. Uh, you've been doing it for years. For years, yeah, since I was like 11. Yeah. yeah. Starting with D&D. We, we've, done made, we've made art for your games. Yes. No, okay, let's talk about yeah. Yeah, yeah. Manny and Steve Chang and Amy Beth Christensen have made custom Star Wars art. Um, characters, for, new for design characters, characters and stuff for char characters. It's well, sort of like generic characters because they have a non-compete Lucasfilm thing. But it's not like I was using it for commercial purposes. So, yeah, they would, no, 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 so no, they're no, like no. characters that could fit into Star Wars that I used for my games, um, my private personal games. Right, artwork that no one will ever see. It's gotten weird. It's gotten it's, very it's totally fifty weird. shades. Of fifty shades <laughs> of sand. It never happened. <laughs> um, what is it? Oh. Oh, I'm getting sick. Oh, oh God. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is two seconds. Force hurl. Yeah. So somebody was asking about the... the let me uh, run away from this uh, do topic. It. Do it, do it. Uh, somebody was asking about the schooling stuff, and I kind of like half answered it, but I really want to make sure that they get the, the correct information if they really want to pass on this to their friend uh, that is looking to get into, a game, into the game industry. Uh, so if you're like... We talk about the school thing a little bit, but past that... Um, I think the most important thing for you to, to do if you're trying to get into a specific studio, like the studio of your dreams, or even just trying to get started, the things you need to research uh, for this particular studio... <laughs> wait, a minute, wait a second, wait a second. What, what? Oh, that guy fell like off the ledge. Okay, and he was holding on. Poor guy. Sorry, Manny, anyway, go ahead. Sorry, Manny, go for it. Oh, it's all good. It was... <laughs> I wish I could see it in real time. It's delayed for me. Um, yeah, actually, this level right here that you're playing, or this section... Um, Designed by uh, Ian Dominguez, one of the craziest oh. designers I've ever worked with. The one of the craziest person person I've ever met in my life. He made this originally so freaking hard. Yeah. Like you, like there were there were snipers everywhere. Like you couldn't you couldn't get you couldn't get across the catwalk. Two steps and yeah. You, yeah. Oh god, it, it was so brutal. And and actually, Ian uh, also uh, designed <laughs> in Force Unleashed two the, the 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 pod room where you know you're kind of scaling up to the top and. At the finale of that game, and that was brutal as well. I mean, he, Ian, always wanted to punish the gamer. <laughs> <laughs> Ian was hardcore. Yeah, Ian was. Ian was a lot of fun. What did he have Where against the now? gamer? <laughs> he, nothing. He, he just like Capcom. Capcom he, he was bringing it old Capcom. school, man. It was like going back to like NES days. Right. Like Mega Man and Ninja Mega Man. Game. Exactly. Like I can't get past it's this. Real man. <laughs> yeah, games back then were they were harder. It's so true. Yeah, it's so true. true. Way more rewarding at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reward was yeah, exactly. that you were. And it's like if you got through this level on the original design, you're just like, yes, I accomplished it's something. It was just just uh, hey Xbox, you know, you you die five times. These are your achievements. Like, but how is that an achievement? Yeah, back then. They Achievements, man. You beat the game. <laughs> I remember. So I have a Wii U, and the only thing I use it for is downloading old Nintendo games. I shouldn't say the only thing, but m majority of my use is playing old school Metroid, playing Zelda: Link to the Past, like playing a lot of uh, these games. You know, and, and, and you know, uh, all those games. You know, were just so much harder, but so fun and so rewarding. And I just remember looking at it going, God, you know, these really were harder back then. Like the original Met. You know, well, yeah, the it, jumping it, puzzles. It was, and... it was back in a time where you left the console on for a oh, week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because there were no... The, yeah, there's no open scene. Either. I remember yeah, getting it, into it, a huge fight with my mom over Castlevania. <laughs> because dude, every time you started dude, Castlevania, you had to start from the beginning. jumped into my brain. Castlevania yeah. was the, was the tentpole game that my friend and I played, and we left. he left it on for a week as we fought through it. And we always... We kept getting stifled at, at Frankenstein. And all anyone had to do to ruin it for you was just come by and push the button off. Oh god! And that would have been it. You would have had to start over again at the top. Well, and that's the thing. You, you we wonder oh why we god, why we flew into rages and threw controllers, and it's because 
it, it wasn't it was partially because we were young and inexperienced and didn't have control of our emotions but partially is we were being tortured yeah. in the most sadistic of ways i mean like for example play ghosts and goblins and you win the game and then it goes oh. yes but that was a dream now start we over start. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the real thing it's gonna be harder this time like what yeah I know. that game was ridiculous hey i wanted oh, to piggyback on your on the your... jumping was the one made it so difficult oh you it's, couldn't yeah. control your jump after you jumped oh i hated that oh yeah it was a yeah. fixed jump right that, that was a big thing we'd say can you control your jumps in this game that was a be yeah. a big deal back in the day. So what were you going to say? I was Maybe? just going to jump on Manny's uh, point about schooling for games. So, you know, I ended oh. up... <laughs> it's like we're teasing them on purpose. Well, no, it's, I, you know, it's hard. I mean, it is very... Um, I started as an intern at Skywalker Sound, and I went to one of those schools, but not for games. Uh, this was back in the 90s, and it was all about post-production and music. I worked at a music studio, and I worked at Skywalker Sound, both as an intern at the same time. Then I worked as a, at another music studio. And even getting in the door at Skywalker, I won an internship, which was like winning the lottery at the time, um, was so hard. But even then, I couldn't get past the next phase of, uh, of you know, getting a full-time job from being an intern and joining the union and all that kind of stuff. And honestly, it never happened for me. And at the time, it was like, I remember going moving into games. This was in 2000. And I left Lucas, or I left Skywalker because I was like, I can't even get a job in the machine room. Like, I, I it's so competitive, and it's so hard. And did there's Brett like five these? guys. Did Brett write these? Brett, did you write these character descriptions? Um, in the data bank. You know, I I don't know. I I helped with them, but no, I think Cameron Suey. Cameron Suey. Cam. Oh, Cam wrote. Yeah, things. I remember yeah. co-writing uh, these with Cam. Cam on Force Unleashed 2. Anyway, I, All right, uh, so what I was going to say. The competitive nature. So, of- so I got into LucasArts, and at the time it was like doing sound for games was like you could read an article about it. But like I, you didn't know how to do it unless you actually did it. There was no no one was teaching it. I remember working on game curriculums with some of the guys um, from Expression a School in uh, Northern California. And... You know, and, and now they teach this stuff quite a bit, and it's so easy to just download tools like Unity and, and Unreal and actually start messing around. Uh, tools like Wise and FMOD and all kinds of tools are out there, but they just weren't out there at the time. But I will say this to give people hope. So, you know, before I left Sony, I was a manager. I managed their sound department in Southern California, and I hired uh, a lot of people. Um, I ended up hiring a lot of sound designers and a lot of dialogue people. You know, and some of them were incredible. Actually, almost all of them were like just rock stars. In fact, they pretty much were uh, all rock stars. Now people are going to be watching this going, was I not one of the rock stars? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, like, they, I, I just was so amazed by the by the talent coming out. So it is very, very competitive. But um, when it came to interns, you know, I wasn't able to keep all of them. That's why I said not all of them. But I was able to keep some of them. And I remember this one that I kept, like she just was able to, she just w- immersed herself in the project and just was like, be, she made herself invaluable to the point where I actually couldn't let her go as a manager. Like, because she was, you know, the, the producers were like, you can't let her go anywhere. We know her internship's up, up, but can you hire her as a contractor? Sure, so I hired her as a contractor. Like, you know, kind of like what you did, Manny, by that? making that, or, uh, her name was Heather Plunkert. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's still there, she's still at Sony. Um, and she knew everything about the organization before she interviewed, you know. Um, she was just super passionate, you know, um, and uh, and just worked really, really, really hard. And it's and just is, is now still there to this day. And, like, it does take a lot of effort and you have to really, really want it. But it absolutely still can be done. And, and it's just a matter of, you know, find the internship, you know, relentlessly pursue the companies that you're interested in. And then when you get there, just make yourself invaluable. Look for what the company's greatest need is and fill it. You know, an event, even if it's not something that you set out to do, eventually you'll get to be able to do the things that you want to do. But, you know, even Walter Murch, the great film editor, you know, who did Apocalypse Now and THX 1138, he said once, you know, a lot of what the creative process is flipping burgers, meaning yeah. meaning that no matter how far you get in your career, you still have to set up your templates. You still have to, like, edit the dialogue. You still have to, you do, have to do a bunch of stuff you don't you want to do. do. You have to log your footage. Mm-hmm. Like, sometimes yeah. you just have to do a bunch of work that isn't glorious. It's not glamorous at all. It's just hard work. It goes for everything, know? yeah. That goes for every discipline. I know, remember... Every creative discipline. You know, this is not Star Wars related, but when I was hired for Battlestar Galactica, um, here, I'll just tell... <laughs> I'll tell the... the <laughs> I'll, I'll tell the slightly longer version than the short story. But basically... Um, I saw this miniseries for Battlestar Galactica for the remake, and I was astounded by how good it was um, on sci-fi with Edward James Olmos and Mary McDonnell, and it was just, Ron Moore wrote it and produced it, and it was just so amazing. It was one of the best things I'd ever seen in terms of the quality of everything, and it wasn't like Star Wars, it wasn't like Star Trek, 
and the acting was all very naturalistic and, and realistic. And uh, so I told my agent that I wanted to be on that. I'm like, tell Robert Alrich, the casting director, I want to be on that, with no expectation that that would do anything, because I, I didn't really have much of a resume at the time. But it worked, and they ended up auditioning me for a series regular for a character named Crashdown. And I went, I auditioned, and it wasn't until about three or four months later that, uh, that I got the call being like, yeah, they want to hire you for Battlestar Galactica. And I was like, whoa, great, what's the part? Like, I know I read for it, but what is it? You know, well, I was a series regular. Okay. And it's a, it's a major character. Like, okay, it's a major character. And they have plans for him. Okay. Because they, they wanted me to fly out the next day. You know, they're like, wow. hey, you audition <laughs> three months later. Like, you need to fly out tomorrow. They want you. And I'm like, mm. okay, but what is it? This is, I'm going to have to move to Vancouver for a while. So what is it? And they said, it's a major character that we have plans for him. When I got there, they were like, Hey, welcome to Battlestar. Um, let me you know, tell you a little bit what's going on. I mean, it's not like you're playing a major character, and it's not like we have plans for him. And it's <laughs> like, oops, wait, uh, that's what? not what my agent oh. told me. <laughs> and I remember just being horrified and, and totally demoralized, and I remember expressing that to David Icke, the producer, a little bit, like some of my confusion, because I'm like, that's exactly the opposite of what I was told to get me to sign on the dotted line. <laughs> so I, I think it was like, you know, whoever was head of sci-fi business affairs said whatever they had to say to get someone in that role in in Vancouver so David Ike's uh, advice to me is he's like well make yourself invaluable I'm like okay what he's like well here's he's like here's here's something when it comes to your dialogue do one as written and then say whatever you want for the rest of the takes ad lib he's like uh, um, uh, chief uh, played by Aaron Douglas. He's like, he had a very small role in our miniseries, but he just ad-libbed a lot. And we found that we really needed that character, so we just kept expanding his role as we were shooting it. And uh, and so, he's like, so he kind of carved out that role. And I, and I, I kind of pointed out, I'm like, okay, that's great. But in your miniseries, you kind of established 12 characters that you need to follow up with. I'm the 13th. Like, we're not going to get to this guy. But he kept saying, well, just, just come up with stuff. So most of the stuff that I do in that first season that you see on screen, which is not a lot, is in fact ad-libbed. Mm. Some of it is written, but a lot of it is ad-libbed. And there's a, whole, there's a lot of things that they wrote, but I did it differently. And uh, <laughs> so I, was, I left the first season feeling very demoralized. But what's cool is, you know, so and I'd asked, I'm like, can we, can we kill him off? Can, you, can we get your mileage out of this character by killing him? And they promised, like, well, when I said that, they said, we'll do something cool because they felt bad for the fact that I'd been out there and I wasn't mm -hmm. really utilized and don't you get shot in the back by Baltar yeah spoiler <laughs> alert but but what was cool is the stuff they wrote for me for season two the three episodes I did for season two they wrote awesome stuff for mm -hmm. me and there was like substantive real things for me to do real acting for me to perform and things that were difficult to perform and part of what I, I believe gave them that confidence was that they saw my ad libs and argued about my ad libs and often put my ad libs into into episodes. So mm -hmm. I think they felt like, okay, well, he's kind of earned this opportunity to act on our, Which, our show. Which, by the way, was a very risky move for a young actor to, to go in and say, you know what, if you're not going to use me, kill me, even though I'm in this TV show. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, but it, it, it shows like initiative and it shows guts. I mean, it's really. And it, and it ended up working. And, and in fact, I remember one of the biggest selling points for you for Starkiller was that you had done both Dexter and Battlestar, and sure. Peter Hirschman was a huge fan of those. Oh, and you had been uh, in an episode of Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which our, our pal Glenn <laughs> right. is, you know, our one of the showrunners and stars of, and yeah. and so and he was a huge fan of that show to the point where he actually gave me a VHS copy of episodes of Always Sunny because I said even though I, I knew Glenn, I hadn't seen the show, <laughs> and this was like 2006. <laughs> he was giving me a VHS copy in 2006. Anyway, it's um, kind of funny how some of that stuff works. That it's like. You may not have done a huge thing for a show, but if you were a part of it and you contributed, people find that to be significant. Oh, here it is. Here Cutscene. They remember, man. They remember. Here's the moment, the Darth Maul moment. Oh. I am certain that I will finally fulfill my programming. This is kind of cool how you, you, it's the best, the greatest hits of Force Unleashed 2. Yep. Yeah, proxy. This was fun to record. I actually have, you know, they, they gave me a, a video of me recording this long session with Hayden directing. I have a video of, of the whole thing. I, mean, I watched it the other day, and I'm like, oh, there's the keeper take. There's the keeper take. That's kind of cool. Yeah. 
I'd love to see some of the B-roll that we... Because there's so much footage that was collected in the making of this game. Oh my god, yeah. Um, by the way, I, I do want to say, Battlestar Galactica, I, I have such respect for those guys. Like, it was ultimately through do, learning how to add those things and to improv tastefully. Because the thing is, you should never do that unless you're sure it can work. If you're ad-libbing and doing things and you really have no business doing it and you're doing it for ego reasons, um, you're going to fail and you're going to waste a lot of money and people are going to be very upset with you. So it, you have to do it in a measured, uh, calculated way. And for the project. For the project. Um, Shut down, project. Here, here's another scene. Cuts in here. Already defeated. Give me some credit, Master. I have one module you've never seen. An enemy I've stalled for years. I was pitching up certain certain vowels. I pitch them up and down. You know, and so I, that I've stalled for years. You know, I was doing, I, I was going line by line and, and pitching certain syllables just to make him sound <clears throat> inhuman and kind of robotic and a little unstable. Mm -hmm. And here's uh, Duel of the Fates, a brilliant music edit choice by Jesse Harlan. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. But tell, tell that story, because I remember you called me one time about Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> Can you tell yeah. that story? Well, what, what was it? What was the story that, that I got? So the story was oh, yes, that you, you were reading for this character called a Zindi, Something right? Like that, yeah. And uh, I remember this very well because I was like, "Oh my God, he's he's crazy and kind of brilliant." I can't because you ended up landing the part. I wasn't working a lot. You weren't uh, working a lot, time. but you went, and it led to like a string of guest stars. After that's that. right. It, that's it just right. somehow like unlocked your karma in 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 town. Or I something. went in and I did an audition for this small role in Star Trek Enterprise, and I just. I didn't do that well. I kind of overdid it. I went way too far. I was way too big, and it wasn't great. And I was walking out of Paramount lot on my way out, and then I was like, did I call my agent for my cell, or did I just walk in again? You called your agent and said, have them see me again. I've got it now. Yes, yes. As soon as I... No, no. You know what it was? Because you went to go visit your I friends. I went to visit my friends who worked on Star Trek, and, and they showed me a picture of what it was that I was supposed to play what the makeup looked like. And I said, oh, no, no, no. And what I did was way too big for that. And I called my agent. I said, can you tell them that I, I get it now and I want to try again? And so, and I remember... Which my, is really risky to do. Like, hey, they've already seen you. They've got so many people to see. And you're yeah, basically, as an actor, requesting it. them to go back in and do it again. Yes. But it worked. And yeah, so I went in and I did it differently. And, and then they ended up hiring me for it. I remember, And I remember the casting director, Ron Surma, was like, yeah, so I'm like, I'm sorry about this. He's like, Sam, we're happy to do it. He's like, if you really want to... He's like, I... He demonstrated some belief in me by just giving me the time to do it again. And Rick Berman came in, and then they hired me for it. And I, I can't remember... I think I had maybe like five lines in that episode, but it was like... It was an important moment where I realized, like, this stuff is... These are all opportunities. Whether you're on a set... And there's an opportunity to contribute a little, a, a new idea, like on the mist, like the handprint, or, you know, or to go in an audition again, or do things the way you want to do them, because it's your audition. It's not anyone else's. It's like, I think this is, applies to all kinds of different disciplines. When you're actually in, in the hot seat, taking a little bit of a risk can be a good thing. But it has to work. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you've, you've wasted people's time. You know, big but it yeah. paid off, you know, big risk, big reward. It paid off. Go forward on being human. I think, you know, it's like it's so many of the things that I learned on Battlestar in terms of that, you know, adding things and coming up with ideas was applied later to being human and, and really everything else I've, I've worked on. And uh, the thing is, if you're gracious and if you realize that you're not you, you have to be able to hear no, someone's got to be able to say no to you and you have to be able to accept that graciously and eagerly. Because ultimately, you have to work in a team. If you can't do that, all the good ideas in the world don't mean anything. You have to be reasonable. You have to, you have to hear what, you know, the greater vision of the project is. And if you're not doing that, then you're then you're adding ideas for the wrong reasons. By the way, we have a question here, or more of a comment, Brett. Maybe you can speak to this. So, um, because there is an actual story behind this, in the novel of the Force Unleashed, it described how the core had taken over Proxy. Do you remember that story? And, and Manny, mm -hmm. you might remember this too because it's the reason why Darth Maul suddenly showed up late in the game. There was a huge story change uh, in terms of this was eventually this was in the script about how the core, the planet core, took over Proxy and the all that. What is the planet core? Before you 
because you know people. The don't planet know. core. The planet now core. Now go. <laughs> anyway, sorry, but yeah, either, either you guys want to weigh in on that? Well, uh, like silver proxy, right, Brett? Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, like it's, it's kind of, exa exactly. It's just like he kind of gets taken over by what? By the planet because Chasm Paratus is like he's manipulating, you know, being you know the energy. Um, but the core so is it, a, a yeah, computer, it isn't it? It basically takes over Proxy. And um, and why and, was that cut? And kind of kind of glitches his system to the point where, you know, he he actually really is trying to kill Starkiller. <laughs> it was like the big. It was like the big climactic finish to Proxy's character. Um, but it wasn't very clear as a concept. It still kind of isn't to me. And I remember there was yeah. this push to, to change it, you know, and it was like, well, you, let's simplify this battle a little bit. Really, what Proxy should do is just be another Jedi battle, and we should have him battle Darth Maul, which would make so much more sense. It was like the low-hanging fruit that Hayden was like, why did we overcomplicate it with this core idea? Why don't we just turn it into this to this battle? And it and it and I think it works so much better. It's so much cleaner. Um, but that was a decision made late in the game, Manny, as you were pointing out. Yeah, and the whole yeah, uh, the whole thing how we actually just barely squeezed Darth Maul in. I'm sure played had some restrictions in how we were able to show all that stuff. But yeah. But what it was, it was a great vehicle to you know what we were talking about before to get Darth Maul in the game because you know when we were thinking of concepts for this game, you know you know Hayden Hayden went through different machinations and different, you know, combinations of what he wanted the game to be and, you know, at one point where, you know, in his mind he was thinking about, like, kind of, I think he always had in mind a trilogy of games, but it, it wasn't always going to focus on one central protagonist being Starkiller. It was going to kind of go through time. So in one game we'd have Starkiller, and then maybe another game he wanted to go. You know, we we were exploring and talking about ideas of like going back into Darth Maul, and like having having like a, an arc and like, Yoda uh, and all these crazy awesome ideas. Yeah, it just had it, it had many uh, force wielders and force users, and you know it, it wasn't originally supposed to be just um, just the central Starkiller was going to be it was going to be you know again through through time through through the Star Wars timeline. And, and just explore different force users. Can you also so it's talk great to get them all into the game this way without it seeing ham fisted because from the start, you know, we know, you know, you know, Proxy turns into Obi Wan and you know and we don't know that it's Proxy until Starkiller, you know, stabs him in the chest. He's like, Oh Master, that was a great battle. You know, and it, it was just, you know, his way of, of you know, Vader's way of programming the droid obviously to to train his his apprentice. So that that's why it I, that's why this segment worked really well, and with Darth Maul because he could conceivably be in Proxy's databank of foes that Star Killer needs to face. So what's what's really interesting too is someone asked about this. Can you explain how Proxy can use the Force or very similar powers? That's actually something we talked about a lot. That we did talk about. That. It's it's not the Force. It's actually he's just using. Force fields. And force fields and tractor proximities beams. and tractor beams and yeah, repulsor technology. Same for Force Unleashed too. Yeah, like droids, like droids, like dress droids that you fight. Yeah. yeah, because that was the the only way we could kind of explain it. That Proxy was outfitted with all of this really dangerous uh, technology, which is what made him such a cool character. He could co sort of approximate. <laughs> see what I did there? Nice. Well, uh, the nice. Force, uh, but was not a Force wielder at all. You know, but but understood very similarly to General Grievous. You know, in terms of training, like he has a whole data bank of moves. You know, he's able to. You know, look at, at how Darth Maul fought versus Shock mm -hmm. T versus, you know, there's a little bit, obviously there's some dramatic license taken there and, you know, uh, but uh, but it worked really well for, for the game. Sam's on the final quick time event. <clears throat> Here we go. Stop I think we're all, we're have, all enthralled with this battle. How, how will it turn out? Who's your going to win? feeble skills, Starkiller, are a new match for my voice acting in the Clone Wars. <laughs> Love or it. my X button press. Yeah, why am I not voicing both <laughs> oh, of these? Well, this is, you know, what's funny is I ended up voicing Darth Maul in this game. That's it was right. very much like, <laughs> it was that sort of thing. But it was all, it was a last minute request from, from a sound designer. Right. From right, Tom. Right. He's like, I need. I need mall efforts. There's just too much going on here, and so I just popped into the booth and was just like, 
doing very guttural sounds that you know and, and the idea was well if it sounds slightly like me that's fine because i'm proxy and it is proxy so it'll just work out but it's right. like one time i voiced maul in in star wars <laughs> that's cool I, 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 you know. had we known about the clone wars <laughs> although you were already doing the emperor i'm sure dara would have been like enough of this guy i want to be all the characters yeah though. i know i want to be all of them <laughs> All right, so let's let's um let's wrap it. That, that was yeah, a key we'll, thing there that we wanted to add. Sorry, I, I, I know it's delayed a little bit, but as Proxy is about to fall off the ledge, you see Star Starkiller actually grab him and save him and throw him back. You know, he doesn't want to destroy him. He just will get him out of the way. That's a great That's detail. Right. Love that detail. Yeah, yeah. There was you know it was an awesome friendship I think between those two characters, and I I wish yeah I just I just wish that every little moment in that script we had time to shoot and. Mm -hmm. really finish and get in the game. I mean, again, we talk about the uh, the scene with um, Starkiller and Juno about the Battle of Callus and how that couldn't be finished. But we find it in the PS2 version, which is cool. Yeah. And yeah. the the battle with Proxy and Starkiller where Proxy is Anakin Skywalker. I thought that was, you know, very dramatically fertile ground right there. Yeah. But do we have any more questions for Manny or Brett Rector before um, we dismiss them? And forget about them. Dismiss. Oh, you know, we have to give away yes. another print. Oh, we have to give away one more print. Pull out That's the true. Boba Fett one. And we have to figure out we how We already gave away the Boba Fett one. No, we, we already gave... Was it the Starkiller, right? Starkiller. Which one did we give away, guys? Here, I wrote it down. Pretty sure... I'm Star on the lace. So you guys held both up. I don't know. Give me Boba Fett. Well, I guess you were going to sign it, so I guess you were talking about Starkiller. Yeah, it was Starkiller. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. So we are now giving away this one. And... Um, do we have any way of doing a lottery, or should we do another trivia question? I think there's some folks who want to do lottery, uh, at least next time when we can, when the bot's working. Yeah, the bot. We don't have the bot just yet. So next we're gonna, time. We're going to have to do something. Uh, can someone think of a good... you want to whisper a... Here, you know what? We uh, have a Force Unleashed specific? We have a Skype. Yeah, it probably should be, right? What is... How about... Uh, Hold on. Well, don't, I've got don't one. Say it, but you don't say it yet, because people will answer. <laughs> yeah. Here, hold on. We'll type it in Skype. I've got, I've got one. Oh, you do? Okay, yes. what, is, what is your question? I'll just okay. type it out. Well, I can't tell you because they'll hear me. Here. Yeah, type it to them and see if this is the best question we can come up with. Ooh. That's a really good one. Go for it. What do you guys think? That's a good one, yeah? Oh, yeah. I like that. All right, David. Oh, man. What that's, is, yeah, what is general... Here we go. Here, Here we, we go. go. Here's the question for the giveaway. Here's the question for the giveaway. Here what we is General Kota's first name what is general no, coda's been... first name <laughs> it's a hard one it's, it's very hard, hard. One. as people search the internet now yeah and spelling counts oh, oh <laughs> there it is <laughs> yes there rogue is. lieutenant rogue lieutenant rogue lieutenant rom coda good job rogue lieutenant oh, wins this boba fett dude these guys are quick yeah you guys are quick Bam. and good spellings job. boba fett there Where? it is. Yeah, and he spelled it right. And he spelled cool. it correctly. That's great. Rom code. Well, Hip Hop Bottomus Prime did not, but that's all right. <laughs> he spelled it more like. <laughs> you just like his name. Crime. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> Rogue Lieutenant, please, please send me uh, a Someone message. Someone wrote crap, but I don't think that was a guess. I think they. Yeah. His crap. first his first name was Crap. Crap Coda. My, my name is General Crap Coda, boy. <laughs> so Rogue I'm also Lieutenant, Rogue Leader. Apparently. Rogue Lieutenant, please send me a, a message and we will get that out to you immediately. So this was a lot of fun, guys. Anyone got any more questions uh, before we before we wrap it up? Um, people answered before they heard. <laughs> oh shit! Uh, How did they do that? Mm. They can't. I blame Brett. I blame Thank Brett. You. Yeah. <laughs> it, it always blame the producer because production. That's production. where it breaks down. <laughs> do you think no, it's we're, possible? We're, we are the field goal kickers. Here's of one. The team. Hold on, we, get, we have a good it's question great here. great when we make that lat, you know, we win the Super Bowl with that, you know, 50-yard kick, but when we miss it and we shank it, you know, wide right, ooh, then that's when millions of dollars are lost. You're saying football things. Yes. People are tuning into this instead of watching football, that's which right. is probably a... Uh, great timing on our part. Oh, great. It's uh, possible to balance visual arts and design with performance, voice, and live action as careers. Uh... You mean in terms of be an artist and be an actor and a voice? I mean, here's the thing. David Collins kind of does that. You're, I'm not a visual artist, though, at all. Well, you're not a visual artist, but you're a sound artist, and you're also a voice actor, and you're also a voice director, and you're a also composer. a musician and a composer, yeah. and you're all these things. So on some rare occasions, you can find some guys who can kind of do a little bit of everything. And that's but not on and he plays right all here. those on TV. 
That's right. That's but right. you can't on, on some. Oh, there's Brett Rector on the screen right there with the with there's the DS, DSLR. But that's a huge thing. in whenever you join a studio as well, if you can do something else besides what your main focus is, <laughs> what your speciality is, uh, the team's gonna la love that and bring you on board. Because you know, once you finish your work, you can be like, oh my God, we need we need somebody to to join the marketing team and you know help do this stuff or we need somebody to jump onto this uh, environment team and help do that stuff. If you have a little bit of that experience and you can help out that team, you're going to be that much more valuable. Yeah, the more you can get plugged into different areas and the more you can help out other people, it's always better. You know, if you if you look at it at a resource chart, it's like, well, we have this many artists, well the art's done. Well, this guy that's one of the amazing things about Adam Piper is like he's he's got engineering and design and and he's creative like he's, you know, and you know, if the more you can do absolutely. Um, on a game like this, I mean, certainly uh, no one wanted me in the art department and I, you know, I, <laughs> I wouldn't have, uh, you know, but nothing is also stopping people from making their own games now. I mean, you can, you can make your game and, and look at, uh, you know, smaller games like Fez or things that are hugely successful. I mean, you, you can kind of do, might take you a while, but you can do a lot of different things with small teams. You know, um, you don't have to wait for a giant studio, which by the way, they're becoming, uh, less and less common you know, big studios mm -hmm. and, and smaller games are just blowing up. So it's something to really consider. Be be diverse. And I also That's, think it's, I don't know about you, Manny and Brett, but it's more fun. It's more fun to have your hand in, in a bunch of different things. It, it, it makes my life better, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, you contribute a lot more that way as well. I mean, you've yeah. got that much more uh, a part of the team. Yeah. Do you guys no, have I, a favorite? I love, I love being a part of, of many facets of production, but one of my favorites, and it goes back to collecting, was working with Hayden and Matt uh, to, to bring the toy line uh, for the Force Unleashed to life. I mean, meeting with people from Hasbro and Sideshow and Gentle Giant and showing the wonderful concepts that we had and the great character design. And, you know, that that was, you know, outside, that, that was like that that hat I got to wear to say, oh, crap, you know, now I'm going to have to go back and, 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 and mine these spreadsheets. But for right now, I get to sit here and talk about toys. That's so awesome. that was just, cool. That was just part of the production process that as a producer, like you can be a creative producer, you can be a technical producer. I mean, there's many hats to wear in production. So um, for any <laughs> of you people that aren't going to be creative, like a Manny Lamas, um, you can be a producer. <laughs> Are you, here's, here's a I'm question. Really, forget all the art stuff. Yeah. Here, you know. Here's a question uh, for you guys. Um, you know what, first of all, uh, what is your favorite costume of all of them? That's one question. And the second question is, why does uh, Juno have such an unorthodox Imperial uniform? Well, the, the, actually, the, the Juno part is, is a good question. You know, I, I mean, well, I mean most Star Wars you know, we, 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 we didn't want her to look like, Jen, you know, Maudie and Tag. Like, she's she's a hot Imperial officer. I mean, she, blonde hair. I mean, she's rocking Unleashed. it up. I mean, we had to kind of accentuate her features and make her, you know, kind of compelling. And also... It's kind of like that, that, you know, that little sauce for Starkiller who, you know, was never around women, didn't know how to be around women. Yeah. So now he's got this beautiful co-pilot who's also kind of a badass. So, I mean, I, I think in that respect is we take licenses at times, um, you know, for, for the flavor of the game. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I would say that my favorite is the evil Starkiller. Mm -hmm. uh, man, he's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, even Juno, she changes her outfit throughout, and she she has a progression as well in her visual design, mm -hmm. not just her her story with with Star Killer. So you see her develop, you know, and tear away little by little, um, not not sexualized, but more in the you know going to the light side. You start seeing her more of rebel kind of outfits come through t towards the end. Yeah. In terms of my favorite costumes, I think it's the first one and the last one. I love his training gear that you first see him in, and then I love the ultimate good costume. It's just sort in of rags when you first yeah, see him. Um, yeah, that's that's actually my answer as well, Sam. Um, yeah. Oh, really? I love those two. Those are yeah. really really yeah, great. I, mean, I, I spent so long getting as much detail as I could into that first one because the first first thing you're gonna see when you saw the apprentice. So I just I went uh, crazy OT and get as much polish out of that of those textures and yeah. models I could. Um, here's a, here's another question. How many people total worked on the Force Unleashed? Ooh. Oh my God, that's a hard well, one because our, our team we were up off. at 180 at one point. I remember mm -hmm. that was a number thrown around. We brought and people that, in from that, Indy and the the other team everywhere. I mean Skywalker, we, yeah, ILMs, but, yeah. But there were also there was the the comic book, the novel, all the all the licensees. So if you count all the licensees, it was hundreds, hundreds and yes. hundreds. Yeah. You know, I mean, there oh, were so yeah, many yeah, the people. Outsource studios, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. we're just talking internally, I guess, but yeah. Plus Chrome, yeah. This the Chrome Studios is probably a hundred people deep in Australia. Plus, I can't remember the name of the studio that did the DS version. 
Um, but yeah, there were there were those multiple teams plus yeah all the licensees. It was a huge undertaking. So I would, it's hard to actually say. I think it's pro, but it's got to be hundreds. Uh, yeah. On our team, though, so, yeah. at its biggest, including all the publishing side, so marketing, sales, PR, um, you know, licensing, it was probably at least 150 or 180 people just inside the building. That's crazy. So, so before we go, um, uh, Manny, where can people find you? And your art. Oh, uh, and, sorry. <laughs> and where can they find your art? Where can they, like, if, they, if people are interested in sort of Acme or your art, where can they find you? Yeah, so um, I started this website called theliveworkshop.com, and I also have my own Twitch channel where I stream my work that I actually do professionally, and I answer questions to all the, inspire, all the aspiring artists uh, awesome. and students and uh, co-artists that are already in the industry. They jump in there, and they like to have the whole artistic environment and it helps them work faster, and it's just, it's just a great environment for anybody wanting to get into the industry or just curious about uh, you know how the stuff gets done. So I do that artwork, and I explain why we do it, how we do it, and uh, the best practices for it. So if you guys are interested in checking that out or you want to ask me some questions and I can hopefully help you out and you know get your portfolio better or get your uh, assets into the game for workshops out there like the Dota Workshop, etc. You can check that out and also we're going to be doing tutorials so you guys can uh, improve yourselves. Uh, so yeah, that's there and I have my personal website which is actually down at the moment but that's at uh, artbymanny.com. Artbymanny.com and what is your Twitch channel again? Uh, live workshop. Live workshop. And yeah. Brett, where can they find you? Um, you if know, you want to be, if you want to be found. Yeah. yeah, I'm just wandering the streets of San Francisco, looking for know. David. Just stop in you Star know. Wars and Google. It's loose and change. Yeah. <laughs> There's all this you, loose can, change. you can find me at Super Seven uh, at Episodic <laughs> and Hate. Uh, one of the and I, I'd love to give a shout out to that store because it's it's my favorite uh, toy store in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and they do great stuff. But They're anyway, really yeah, you can find you probably find me there. Yeah. And they can also pick up the, the book to uh, Hotel Transylvania too. Exactly. Thank awesome. you. Thank you, David Collins. Yes, you bet. For that plug. Yes. <laughs> hey, you well, guys are doing an awesome job with this replays. I, I love coming back and watching the shows and seeing the playthroughs and hearing the stories and brings us back to just how amazing the, the team was and the, the time, man. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you, oh, guys. Thank it's, you. it's a yeah, lot of fun. You. and brings Thank back you, guys, for sure. And thanks to all the audience yes. you know, for, for tuning in. I mean, it's... It's a labor of love that was that was brought to you with love from from many, you know, many Bothans died to bring you the force. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, that's right. That, that's or artists, at least. <laughs> many artists and producers. Yes. Well, guys, thank you very much. We're going to close it out, and we'll see you um, soon for episode four, which is either going to be the final one or the ne second to last. Yeah, one. second to last. We're not. A sure. new hope. A new hope. A yes. new hope. Yeah. So we're going to see who uh, we can wrangle up. We have some ideas of who we want to get on there. Um, it's interesting. Some of the people that, that we want to get on there have to go and get approval from Lucasfilm to, to be on this. So we'll ah, see. Ah, yeah. interesting. So we shall see, but uh, it, you know, hopefully it'll be next week. If not, it'll be the week after that. But we're going to uh, put together a very special one for next time. Sweet. And you guys are awesome. Manny, thank you. Brett, thank you for being with us. Um, Jack, thank you for modding. And uh, thank you, thank you everyone for uh, for showing up. You guys are awesome. Thanks, guys. And I remember, concur. Thank, thank you, David. Thanks, and, guys. And Sam for uh, allowing me to be a part of this this endeavor. It, it was awesome. awesome. It's it's great going back in time and thinking about these the times that we had making this great game. Yes, so indeed. good, so good, awesome. All right, guys. Talk to everyone later. Talk to you soon. Right. May the right. horse be with you. Remember the horse. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> also with you. The image oh. that you, you guys saw just go by that actually was in penthouse. <laughs> What? Yeah, that that Maris Brood render that we did. What just that happened? was for an article for Penthouse. This took a turn. It Adrian, took a turn. Yeah, Adrian, we got yeah. into uh, an article, and, and they that they wanted that piece from. We Portland. have to go, so you guys. We have studio, to go. <laughs> it's over. We have to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys, um, and go check out uh, Penthouse Magazine. Penthouse Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's it was a family <laughs> podcast until then, and yes. <laughs> now it's it's something else. But uh, thanks a lot, you guys. No, thanks, thanks, you guys, and thanks for taking thanks. the time.